good morning. I would like to welcome you to our event co-organized by Danube Institute and Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We are here in this beautiful building of Bacchani Lajos Foundation. And I have to be honest, initially, originally we planned a V4 conference on this same date back in December. Researchers, uh, experts coming from, uh, from Visegrad group countries to speak here about the cooperation of, of the V4. And then the, the war started in Ukraine on 24th of February. So we had to modify our plans and to speak on a very different topic today. Um, the topic of a, a new world order which may rise, rise from, um, from these events, from these very tragic events happening today, happening in our neighborhood. So today's <clears throat> event will um, explore the topic of, of the consequences of the war, the consequences on, of the war on the world order. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> we'll start with the presentation of uh, Andrew Roberts, who's a, a distinguished historian and a journalist coming from <clears throat> Great Britain, uh, who's here uh, with the invitation of the Danube Institute for, uh, for next weeks, few weeks. He's also a visiting professor at King's College in London. Um, so he will give a brief, uh, a brief like, framework, a brief intro introduction on uh, the post-Second World War order, order how, how did it start and how did it last for the, for the last decades. Uh, then we will have a short uh, option for uh, questions and answers, so you can, you can you can collect some questions for, for uh, Mr. Roberts and, and we can have a, a short discussion uh, on, on, on the topics we will be talking about. <clears throat> and after that, we have a moderated panel discussion about the recent events and the consequences uh, to, to our uh, system and our international world order. So um, I would like to welcome our speaker, Mr. Andrew Roberts, uh, to make his speech. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be invited to address you uh, this morning. And thank you very much indeed, Anton, for those uh, kind words. And may I say what a, uh, what a um, privilege it is also to be a visiting fellow here at the Danube Institute, which I'm hugely enjoying. And uh, thank you to, to John uh, O'Sullivan for that. Um, the important and profound historical document that I would like to, uh, you to bear in mind during this, uh, during this presentation is, which, which uh, covers an awful lot of the history of, um, of Europe and indeed the world from 1951 to 1985, uh, is Billy Joel's song, We Didn't Start the Fire. Um, specifically, of course, that, uh, that key refrain that comes uh, late on in it, um, that the world's been turning, uh, so the world's been burning since the world's been turning. Historians, unfortunately, however, have to concentrate on um, specific moments. And the six that I would like to uh, concentrate on start with the Berlin airlift of uh, June 1948. Of course, after the Second World War, the economic architecture, which was set up by Bretton Woods and by Dunbarton Oaks, were, uh, which I think overall has been tremendously uh, positive, the free trade and, uh, and free economics that it brought in, at least for the non-communist world at that time, were tremendously good for uh, the world but on a security level, there wasn't the same kind of architecture. Uh, the, the great hopes for the United Nations were um, dashed early on. And by June 1948, Stalin um, put the squeeze on, uh, on Berlin. And it was responded to, of course, by the airlift, by the Truman administration, which continued for 11 months until the May of 1949, and by that time, specifically in April 1949, uh, NATO was created in order to deal with what was essentially a Russian-inspired First Cold War. Um, the way in which this uh, all uh, began 
was important. It was also in April 1949 that the Soviets um, tested their first nuclear weapon. And so one sees from that point on, from that April in 1949, a, uh, an, an architecture, security architecture, that was um, pretty much essentially NATO versus uh, Russia and its allies that continues all the way through to 1956, November 1956, when it became clear that the here in Budapest that the um, Soviets were willing to shed blood and large amounts of it in order to keep their side of the um, of the Iron Curtain uh, completely under their control. So that was the second key date from April 1949, November 1956, and then one can essentially fast forward. Uh, a, a, a long time until the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989. The, the world, at least this part of it, was set in aspic essentially for, uh, for all those years until you saw the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism and the, uh, and the great strides made towards democracy, freedom and self-government in countries like uh, Hungary, but, uh, but many others. Fast forward then to September 2001 with the 9-11 uh, attacks on New York. And there are two ways to look at this. Either they were a gigantic distraction from the uh, true threats to the, uh, to the peace of the world, or alternatively they were, as I believe, a genuine totalitarian terrorist threat uh, to the Western order and one that had to be defended militarily. And when the uh, American-led coalition invaded Afghanistan in uh, 2001, there were 13.4 Afghans, 13.4 million Afghans, and the, these numbers are quite important um, to try to remember for reasons I'll come on to in a moment. The population of Hungary, by the way, in 1956, when the Russians invaded, was uh, 9.8 million. Uh, there were 13.4 million Afghans. And when in 2003, the US-led coalition invaded Iraq, there were 25.6 million um, Iraqis. But the, what one has to remember, of course, is that by no means were the entire populations of Afghanistan or uh, Iraq opposed to the um, US-led coalition. This is, a, this is a, a key factor for when one tries to look for precedence for what uh, Vladimir Putin did on the 24th of February of this year. Fast forward again then to another, what I believe to be absolutely key date, which was the September of last year, 2021, when Joe Biden decided unilaterally to withdraw American forces from Afghanistan, which led, needless to say, as we all know, to an immediate collapse of the Afghan government. The Afghan president was not a Zelensky who was willing to stay and fight in his capital uh, to the end. He instead um, uh, slipped out of the country as soon as he possibly could. And the result, of course, was that the Taliban were in Kabul within a matter of, uh, of um, weeks, if not days. And this, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, was the key factor in sending a message to uh, Vladimir Putin that the West was so weak, was so demoralized, was so divided, that it would not do anything, um, and that ordinary people, in this case the uh, Ukrainians, would not fight back if he launched another of his, what he wanted to um, be a lightning raid, a, a blitzkrieg attack, of course, this time on, uh, on Kiev. But when one uh, considers the other wars that have taken place since 1949, again and again, they are against uh, populations far, far smaller than the 44 million um, Ukrainians that, uh, that one uh, sees fighting today. Um, 42 million because of the 2 million refugees. The number of um, people who lived in North Korea in 1951, for example, was 10 million. Um, and of course, that also was not a invasion of North Korea. There were uh, strategic attacks on uh, the, the territory of North Korea, but it was never intended to be and never was a Western 
um, invasion of North Korea in the same way that North Vietnam was not um, uh, was not invaded except uh, from being bombed from the air. In 1965, there were 18 million North Vietnamese. Um, the Afghans, as I say, were around 13 million, and the population was pretty much the same at the time of the Russian invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. And then you have only 7.6 million Serbians at the time of the Kosovo um, wars. First of all, the 1991 to 1992 um, struggle, and then the Kosovo War of 1998 to 99. So these are relatively small, certainly compared to Ukraine, 44 million people in Ukraine, relatively small numbers. And, and the key thing is also, of course, that in all of those cases that I mentioned, um, or almost all of them, you, you wouldn't necessarily say the same um, of, um, of North Vietnam, the, um, there were divided councils in the countries that were being um, that were being attacked, unlike in Ukraine today, where there seems to be, um, uh, apart from it, of course, in the two breakaway republics and the Crimea, a solid, unanimous support amongst Ukrainian people for, uh, for President Zelensky and his, uh, and his stance. The idea was clearly, I think, this blitzkrieg invasion um, but the trouble with blitzkrieg invasions is that they have very rarely worked in the 75 or so years since the end of the Second World War. You can see them on occasion. The Six-Day War in 1967 the, um, uh, was an example of winning complete air superiority in a matter of hours. Um, the, uh, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, also air superiority was was won by the US-led coalition uh, in a matter of hours. But for some reason, the lessons of history have not been learned by Vladimir Putin. He thinks of himself as an historian. We know that because of the 5,000-word essay that he wrote about, uh, about Ukraine essentially not being a real country that he published last July. Um, he likes to pose as an historian, but again and again, he seems to have failed to learn the lessons of history uh, certainly of the ones since the, uh, since the Second World War. It was Goebbels who said that um, the Operation Barbarossa would be a, he told, the, uh, he told Adolf Hitler that it would be like uh, kicking in the door and the whole rotten edifice would come down. And that seems to have been the assumption made by the Russian high command um, on the 24th of February, 2022. Um, and... Uh, and it has been proved to be, uh, to be completely incorrect. The, one of the lessons of, um, of history, it strikes me, um, is that if one is going to attack a, uh, a country, especially a, of a country of uh, such size, the second largest country in Europe, um, one should listen to the, uh, to the advice of um, people like uh, Karl von Clausewitz, um, who would not have said that it should be done through seven different axes of attack. And that's a truly extraordinary thing. The weighting of that attack should have concentrated on Kiev, and it should have obviously attempted to, uh, to uh, kill President Zelensky instead, rather like um, Osama bin Laden in the, uh, in the uh, Torah Bora Caves, he managed to, uh, to survive and is now showing um, what I, as a biographer of Winston Churchill, am the first to say is essentially Churchillian style of leadership. And he showed that particularly in his speech to the House of Commons, which is really the House of Parliament because um, so many members of the House of Lords were also crammed into the galleries uh, when he said that uh, his people were going to fight in the streets and in the forests and so on, and they should never surrender. This is a total and complete paraphrase of Winston Churchill's great speech of the 4th of June, 1940. Um, when Henry Kissinger wrote his doctoral thesis at uh, Harvard back in the, um, in the early 1950s, he uh, came up, it was about, it was about um, Metternich and uh, Castlereagh and the creation of the great peace 
of 1815 in, uh, in Europe at uh, Vienna. Um, he came up with this concept of legitimacy, of, a, of an, a state acting legitimately and of being legitimate. It, didn't, it wasn't a legal definition by any means. There are many things that, um, that could give a state legitimacy, including its age and, uh, and the uh, uh, proportion of its people that, uh, that believe in it and its, and its natural authority and so on. There are lots of um, things. Law wasn't one of them, but nonetheless, he argued that certainly from uh, 1815, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, through to the outbreak of the Crimean War in 1854, the 1853, um, the, that period of nearly 30 years of peace in Europe was uh, essentially established because the legitimate states did not do illegitimate things. And he, of course, in his own time, uh, extended that concept. Uh, in many ways, his, his uh, defense or his promotion of uh, detente and his intellectual defense of detente was based on this concept of legitimacy, which he did bestow on the Soviet Union. Um, but what we see, it strikes me today, uh, in the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a complete... Um, reversion to the, um, to the previous period, the Napoleonic period, where legitimacy did not exist. In fact, it was an attempt over, to overthrow legitimacy. Bonapartism, um, another person who I've written a biography about, um, was, a, um, was essentially a dynamic uh, concept but one that could be extremely um, dangerous, of course, for the peace of Europe, and, uh, and so it's turned out. And I think that when one looks to at President Putin today, it's very difficult to find precedents from the last 75 years. I think you do have to go back to that pre-Kissingerian legitimacy concept uh, and, uh, and the period before 1815. Just simply because uh, I've often heard it said that the Russians must be treated with uh, kid gloves because otherwise they become paranoid or they are paranoid. And it strikes me that um, that is wrong. Um, you, you wouldn't treat an actual paranoid person in that way. You'd be, you'd be, you'd be mad to do that. You have to uh, treat them carefully, of course, um, but, uh, but not indulge them in the way that uh, has been done so often in the last 75 years. Uh, I saw in one of the British newspapers, uh, someone wrote that uh, were the Russians to uh, get to the, to invade Western Europe and get to the Pyrenees, um, then they would claim that the Spanish were about to attack them. Um, and I think there's, a, uh, there's very much a, a sense of that, that, um, that we give them enormous amount of leeway because of this concept of Russian paranoia. And one only has to look at the um, propaganda coming out of Russia at the moment and certainly the way in which the Russians are speaking to their own people in uh, Moscow at the moment, where they will put American flags over um, countries over the maps of, uh, of countries such as uh, Poland and, uh, and Germany and so on, to recognize that there is a very strong strain of paranoia which, um, which needs to be intelligently countered. Um, one of the things that I also, as an historian, did not expect uh, at all since the 24th of February um, of this year was the unanimity of the West, um, the strength that's being shown in the West, the strength that's being shown across the globe, essentially. Um, yes, there have been countries like India and Saudi Arabia that have refused to condemn the uh, invasion in uh, the United Nations. But overall, it does seem extraordinary that of the 190 countries in the world, which very rarely ever agree on anything, 131 of them, in the General Council of the United Nations voted to condemn this uh, invasion. And only four stood by Russia, um, Belarus, Eritrea, North Korea, and um, Syria. One rather suspects that were the Martians to invade this country, this world and, uh, and start vaporizing cities uh, all over the world, um, then they would be denounced, except for by Eritrea, 
uh, Belarus, North uh, Korea and Syria, who would at least be able to make some positive reference to the uh, little green men in the General Assembly of the United Nations. So you've asked a, an historian um, today to, uh, to try to, I think the reason you have asked a historian is to try to find precedents for what we are living through. Um, but I'm afraid I must admit defeat. I, I, I failed. The world has been burning since the world's been turning. Uh, but today, it strikes me, it is burning in a manner uh, and as part of a phenomenon that has not been seen in the lifetimes of almost every single person in this room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, great presentation. I would like to open the floor for some questions. Um, so whoever has any questions, please uh, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and, and go on. Yeah, gentleman here, please. Mihai Filip, uh, university professor uh, of diplomatic history at the National University of Public Service. Uh, uh, I congratulate you for your brilliant uh, historical uh, presentation. And uh, uh, the first idea came after me is uh, that uh, the word, word order uh, which was built up on the, on the consensus of the victorious great powers uh, after the Second World War is upside down now. So uh, a consensus of uh, the Soviet Union, United States of America, UK, uh, was essential to, uh, to build up this uh, world order and including the present day uh, boundaries. Uh, and uh, the crisis now, it, it, this, this is uh, in my mind, is completely different from, from this world order because we are speaking about uh, successor uh, states war between, between them because the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and incidentally Czechoslovakia uh, exploded. Uh, Czechoslovakia in the uh, peaceful way, uh, the Soviet Union uh, and Yugoslavia in bloody wars. And uh, uh, what is your opinion? Uh, uh, this is leading us to a completely different world order from that of uh, World War II world order. Yes, um, thank you for your kind words. Um, well, th the great thing about an historian is that you aren't expected to know what's going to happen next. <laughs> I, um, I, can, I can tell you what's happened up until now, but the idea that uh, I can explain the architecture of the new world disorder um, is, uh, is, is frankly um, uh, beyond me. You're absolutely right, of course, that, that uh, these um, recent events have... Um, Turned and by recent events, I include, of course, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, which, as I say, I think might have been a trigger. We'll discover historians will discover someday in the future the extent to what it really, to which it really was a trigger. But you're absolutely right; it has turned the um, the process upside down. We haven't, for 75 years, frankly, wanted a very, very well armed Germany. Um, for an ancient historical reason, well, not that ancient, for 75 years ago historical reasons. When one looks at the 75 years of German history before 1939, it started five wars. Since 1945, it has been a model democracy and, if anything, too neo-Pacific, um, in, uh, in my view. And uh, in the last uh, two weeks. It's promised to spend 100 billion euros and, uh, and get up to 2% of GDP in defense spending. I mean, this is an absolute revolution in, uh, in German thinking. You know, it's, it's sending lethal weapons to Hungary when it was only sending helmets. This is something that um, could not have been predicted by anybody, frankly, even two weeks ago. So, so you're right. Yes, things are being turned upside down. And, um, but I'm, I'm certainly not going to uh, make any predictions because I'm not uh, stupid and I'm also, um, I'm not qualified. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Is this working? Yeah. I'm asking you to make another prediction. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it seems to me that since, probably since the Bolshevik Revolution, that um, I, on the left in European countries, and actually beyond the left into, on, into the right, there's been, a, um, ideology has played an important part in our diplomatic assessments and our military alliances and such matters. Now, it seems that that particular, I mean, for example, the historian David Gress suggested that um, Western policy alternated between two different poles from um, the mid 30s, namely that when uh, it, the poles were anti fascism or anti totalitarianism, uh, after the Nazi Soviet pact, the West adopted an anti totalitarian uh, perspective. Um, after the um, uh, end of the war, it adopted, well, after the invasion of Russia, it had adopted an anti fascist perspective. It then went back to anti totalitarianism after 1948 and so on. And, and I think you can see this play out uh, to the point that after 1968, um, America um, became, in a sense, an, almost an anti fascist villain um, because of the Vietnam War. Do you what? It seems to me that that particular kind of way of looking at things has just disappeared now, or should have done. What's it going to be replaced by? Um, I, yes, you're quite right. It certainly has uh, essentially evaporated. I mean, this was brought home very powerfully uh, yesterday in uh, London when the Stop the War Coalition, which was, is, was essentially a communist front organisation, uh, which was an umbrella although it was an umbrella for, um, for peace movements and for uh, Christian peace movements of the Quakers and so on. But essentially, it was driven by a uh, small group of Corbynite uh, extreme left-wingers. Um, actually, for the first time, criticized Putin. This is, he had never done this before. Uh, it was blaming the invasion of, um, of uh, Ukraine on NATO, uh, directly, and, and that's what its signs were saying, and that's what its, um, its press releases were saying on NATO. And, uh, and now it's rode back on that because of the um, collapse in its support, the um, donors refusing to, to continue to give money. I mean, make, the largest donor, I'm certain, was Moscow in some way or another. Um, but nonetheless, it's extraordinary that if even they... Um, are now criticizing um, Russia, that there obviously is an enormous sea change going on in the, um, in the left, at least in, in Britain. What it's going to be replaced by, uh, I wonder, I think quite a lot depends, frankly, on how long this war goes on for. If, it's, uh, if it goes on for months or even years, if there's some uh, partition of uh, Poland that takes place after the, the death of Zelensky in uh, Kiev, I think that... Um, it could completely revise the um, way that the left looks at international relations. I hope it does. It should have. I mean, all of these things should have actually happened 10 years ago or more. Um, they are really only catching up with, uh, with what most people on the right have been saying for a long time. Uh, good morning. Morning. You mentioned some of history's great tyrants in discussing precedent for the current situation. And um, looking back at Napoleon, Hitler, and Stalin, I wonder if you care to venture an opinion as to Putin's current mental state and how he's likely to react to the fact that things are not going as he planned. Um, well, I'm always a bit um, nerve-wracked about using the... Uh, um, about trying to look into present-day mental states. I've just written a biography of George III, and it's difficult enough to work out what was wrong with him, and that was 200 years ago. Uh, and so, uh, also in a sense, I think it sometimes lets, lets dictators off um, by saying that they'd gone mad. Uh, I don't believe that, that President Putin has gone mad. I just think he's extremely ruthless. He's, he's amoral. He is uh, an evil dictator. The idea of him uh, just having suddenly uh, gone so mad as to invade Ukraine strikes me as, um, as essentially a way of, um, of minimizing his personal responsibility for, for what's happening. Um, when one thinks of that 
essay that I mentioned earlier that was published in July 2021, um, that very much signaled or should have signaled to the world what he was intending to do about Ukraine. It essentially said that Ukraine was not a legitimate country and was and was uh, part of Russia. So, um, you know, are we saying that he was mad back in the last July? Um, one can look at all sorts of things that he did. I mean, when one looks for the for the sheer level of ruthlessness, I personally go back to the sinking of the submarine, the Kursk, where um, it was considered, at least by some uh, American naval uh, uh, officers, that had he agreed to the British Navy, the Royal Navy, and the American Navy's offer to uh, to try to help the the suffocating sailors in that submarine, um, that they could have actually been um, they could have been uh, uh, saved, but he wouldn't because he didn't want NATO to to get inside a um, a Soviet uh, sorry a Russian submarine. So you know to have that kind of um, level of uh, ruthlessness, which he's shown again and again, of course, especially in Chechnya, and the possible um, um, false flag uh, attack on Russian. Uh, territory in um, by the supposedly by the Chechens, it, I think you can trace a long history of something that is far more uh, repulsive than just mental illness. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for your excellent presentation. You spoke about legitimacy and uh, illegitimacy. Do you have the impression that the very uh, monol almost monolithic reaction against Russia in the UN and generally in the public opinion is precisely a confirmation that legitimacy, legitimacy still matters, that we are still in the age of legitimacy and when somebody tried to, to challenge that basically, he, that backfired on him, and wh what is also your 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 reaction about the this, precisely this public opinion, these economic sanctions like that we cannot no longer call soft power because it, they seem to be a hard power, and also the for example the the, the reaction also of like the global capitalism, the fact that uh, uh, so many big enterprises are now withdrawing from Russia. That sounds symbolic, but maybe that's also linked to this uh, an attachment of uh, the vast majority of mankind towards legitimacy. What do you think about it? Um, well, you've asked me three questions, and I'm bound to forget the last one, so you're going to have to remind me of the last one. But uh, um, yes, I think that the, um, uh, that the world does believe in the concept of legitimacy. Uh, it's not necessarily the Kissingerian concept, because I think it, it does... Uh, the, uh, world opinion is much more interested in in the legalities. In it doesn't seem to consider a war to be legal unless the United Nations have uh, have uh, signed off on it, as we discovered in the very strong global anti-American um, uh, sense that one got in 2003. I thought that was wrong myself, but nonetheless, you know that was what the uh, what the world was saying, or at least a large percentage of it, and. And now you see it in a very uh, much stronger way with, um, uh, with Russia and Ukraine. With regard to global capitalism, um, I, I, I see the way that um, it's, it's essentially deracinated. The, the CEOs of, of com world companies uh, don't need to be uh, come from the same country. In fact, very often they don't come from the same country as the uh, as the majority of the workers in those countries. Uh, it's a uh, it has become so global that I must admit, as a conservative, I started worrying about um, the patriotism of uh, of various um, uh, commercial enterprises. Um, and now I think I'm probably wrong because actually the response of global capitalism to this, to, to the uh, Russian invasion of um, Ukraine, has been magnificent. I mean, it's been ex totally extraordinary how many companies uh, have essentially um, not put their shareholders' interests um, first, but instead have, uh, have put um, uh, political pressure or at least... Um, some kind of a, a moral decision higher than the than the thing that they're essentially there to do, which is to increase earnings per share for their shareholders, and and um, and that is a is again something as a capitalist that I was 
worried about for, for 20 years because they were doing it in all sorts of areas, especially in the, um, uh, um, in the green um, and environmental world where I, I was you know, concerned. However, this has just been truly extraordinary. My only, my only worry about it is that, uh, of course, if uh, McDonald's and Coca-Cola really do not go to uh, Russia and sell their goods in Russia, the Russians are actually going to get stronger um, and fitter and healthier, and it's probably not going to be very good for the West in the long run. <laughs> Sorry, was there a second question as well? That's it. You're Would happy. You answer to them. Thank okay, you. there you are, kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, this, is, it, this is really just your opinion, Andrew. Um, I've heard some, read some that says you know, Russia's screwed up and Eason, Putin's not doing well. But then, just the other day, I was listening to Dan Hoffman, former CIA station chief, I believe, in Moscow. Anyway, very someone I trust his opinion. And he said he really is expecting the worst is yet to come and that Putin will start doing really nasty things, maybe chemical weapons, et cetera, uh, in order to uh, you know, terrify the Ukrainian population into submission. And in, I, I know we are in the fog of war, but between the side saying everything's great and the side saying it's gonna be a disaster, where do you fall? Very much in the second camp. I think it will be a disaster. I uh, I don't know for, for at all whether or not uh, Kiev is going to fall. Um, I don't. I can't see President Zelensky escaping from it or running away. You know that if you if you take the logic of everything he said, this wonderful Churchillian rhetoric, um, some of the most powerful uh, military oratory that I've um, heard uh, since Churchill. It strikes me that he has to f stay in, in Kiev and fight to the death. Uh, if he does do that, I think that he will be a Ukrainian hero for 500 years. Um, and I think that it will make it much more difficult, in fact, for, for Putin to partition the country, ultimately, because of his, uh, because of his, um, his uh, Zelensky's um, memory and his, uh, of his charisma. But... Um, no, I, I'm afraid what dictators tend to do in this situation when they have been, um, when they have been halted or, or slowed down, um, what they do when they recognize that the world is against them anyway, when they realize that if they fail, they could be overthrown and could uh, wind up in the International Criminal Court, which is obviously where Putin ought to be. It strikes me that all historical... Um, uh, precedent that I can think of um, states that he is going to, uh, <laughs> I was about to say, no more Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> he's hardly Mr. Nice Guy, but it was, it, this, is going to, uh, this is going to get um, significantly worse um, long before it gets better. And on that happy note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, and we'll go on for the next, uh, our second panel. Um, I'd like to, to ask our speakers to come here. First of all, John O'Sullivan, uh, president of Danube Institute. Uh, Rodrigo Ballester, um, head of the European Studies at uh, Matthias Corvinus uh, Collegium. Martin Ugrosdi, the director of Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And I'm looking for Jeremy Carl, uh, visiting uh, fellow at uh, Danube Institute and research fellow at Hoover Institution. Thank you very much. So uh, our task today at this very panel is not to talk about the war itself in Ukraine, but we would like to analyze the consequences of the of the conflict what what does it mean for for europe what does it mean for uh for the world and for the global world order um and it will be a moderated discussion so i'll ask a few questions and then i'll open the floor and everybody here will have a chance to to ask our distinguished uh, speakers to uh to ask questions about their opinion my first question to our panel will be um well uh, a general question 
what do you think? What are the main? What would be the main consequences of this war uh, uh, started by, by Russia in Ukraine? The, well, basically, the first big war uh, in Europe since uh, the Second World War. Is whether or not the solidity and um, uh, unity of the West that has been achieved in response to Vladimir Putin's uh, illegal, uh, aggressive, and thoroughly immoral war is whether that unity will survive and become the basis of, um, of, uh, of the West going into the future. I would like to be completely confident that it will, and I don't dismiss that possibility at all, because the very nature of the war as it's now being fought uh, by Russia uh, is something that, as Andrew demonstrated very clearly, uh, really outrages uh, and all decent people. They, the, it's only a handful of, of uh, dictator, dictator-led regimes which it doesn't um, outrage. Uh, the, uh, the exception to that, I'd have to say, is India. And I, frankly, I think India is beginning to move more into a position of outrage and anger. And it, its failure to do so more quickly is down to the fact that, that the Soviet Union and Russia have been the closest supporters of India all through the Cold War. Uh, that, uh, th that's a, a relationship which they have valued, and they really don't want to break with it if they possibly can. But it seems to me, at least, the signs are that they are moving to do so. Certainly, to, uh, they, they did, in fact, not support Russia at the UN. Now, uh, India strikes me as an important case here because it has the same kind of moral debate over its policies in the world as, the, as we do in the West. I mean, it's not a country in which um, people take up uh, contemptuous attitudes towards um, international law uh, and, um, and, and international morality. It takes those things seriously, and we do. And we do even when we uh, are, in a sense, um, criticizing them, when we recognize the limits of, of law and morality as influences in foreign policy, we still nonetheless are uh, motivated by them. Um, um, Russia is, so to speak, a, a bit further away from us than India is in that regard, which is why it's so, dis but it still does have those kind of discussions, um, which is why it's so alarming to see the way in which Russia is responding with apparent at least 70% support for what Putin has done. I myself believe that that will dissolve as time goes by and as the information gets through to the Russian people as to the nature of the war being conducted on their behalf and in their name. And I think that will change. Something like the long penitence of Germany following the Holocaust. Remember, uh, the Germans didn't, well, we, the Allies didn't realize what had happened in, in the Holocaust really until 45, and that when the, the camps were discovered and um, Belson had this huge impact uh, when people saw what had happened on Western opinion. I think Russian opinion is going to in, in go through that same um, situation. So I think all, that's, that's very important and very true. But will, um, will the solidarity exist typified particularly, it seems to me, by the conversion of Germany. Well, I think German, some aspects of that German conversion will become permanent part of the German personality. The German personality is a changeable one, um, and, but it, is, it will undoubtedly absorb um, what has happened in relation to, uh, happened in this war, and it, that, that will make it different. But there are so many important forces in German political life that have put their money on a completely different approach that one cannot be completely confident, it seems to me, that the, the unity of the West will stay on indefinitely. You have German industry, which really, um, uh, uh, and whose party, the Christian Democrats, and to some extent the FDP, they had put their, so to speak, long-term money on a close commercial relationship with both Russia and China. Will that um, just those impulses disappear? I don't think so. The green, the, there's a new 
um, government is composed of socialists and greens. Um, will, will they um, abandon um, their, the same attitudes which they have had recently? In some respects, the Greens are strengthened by this because of all the parties, they were the party that was most, been most hostile to the idea of a close alliance, admittedly a commercial one, uh, with Russia and particularly with China. They've been the party most disturbed by what's happened to the Uyghurs in, in there. So I have to think that uh, the balance of opinion has changed in Germany, but that there are so many important forces um, uh, in, in German life that one cannot necessarily think that it will retain its current passionate objection to what is going on. And my main piece of evidence for saying that, and this is where I'll end, is of course that the, um, the Germans have not wanted to um, make the, ab the abrogation of the swift uh, financial uh, arrangements cover uh, oil and gas. You can see why in practical terms, of course, but on the other hand, um, yeah, it, the fact that that, that c unless there is going to be a dramatic change in Germany's, um, the, the way in which Germany actually runs its industry, the way in which where it gets its fuel from, the way in which it, it, where, it where it exports to, I don't think we can say that, um, that the Germans are going to support uh, very strongly a new Cold War attitude, which is what we're talking about. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm going to take my privilege as the American on this panel to kind of give an American perspective, and it is just an American perspective, not, not def the definitive American perspective. I'll try not to make it the ugly American uh, perspective. Um, I'd say a couple things. Um, I think first, the most consequential uh, element we have here is the, um, the rearmament of Europe, if you will, um, that's maybe a slightly more ominous way to put it. Maybe a, a better way to put it or a nicer way to put it would be a Europe that's more serious about its defense policy. Uh, Prime Minister Orban uh, gave an, a really interesting interview in general in, in Montaner uh, last week or maybe this week um, that I'd recommend folks read if they haven't read it already. Uh, one of the things that he said uh, with relative to the Ukraine crisis was basically, um, I'm giving a, a less polite paraphrase, but, but basically the substance being accurate, that Europe has been free riding on American defense for a long time. He talked about kind of uh, the two wings being very unbalanced of this particular bird and that he thought that was uh, needed to end. And uh, I heartily agree with him on that. And uh, I actually think even though this uh, will have some consequences uh, that are obviously inherently unpredictable and uh, may lead to some sort of uh, smaller scale conflicts where you might not have had one in a uh, unipolar world or a US-Russia uh, world. I think overall this is, in my view, a good thing. Um, this was certainly, a, you know, I should confess, I'm a, a former Trump administration uh, official um, and I think uh, the president, uh, President Trump, kind of made it clear that this was his view of, uh, of what should have happened, but he was certainly not alone in that. I think for a long time there have been frustrations in the U.S. security community about the uh, percentage of uh, GDP being devoted to defense in Europe, and I think uh, the rebalancing of that uh, is helpful. So that's actually, to me, a slightly more optimistic um, kind of way to look at it. Uh, the more sort of grinchy way that I'm afraid uh, the message that I would deliver is, I think a lot of the sort of more positive reaction you're seeing from the US right now. It's a little bit like, for those of you who've spent time on farms, if you, you cut a head off a chicken off and it will run around um, uh, and it thinks it's alive, but it's, it's really dead. Um, I see a lot of that going on with the head in this question being the official uh, response, particularly of the Republican Party uh, toward this, which is a great deal more enthusiastic and militant than the uh, median GDP, uh, GOP voter. And what's I think even more important GOP thought leaders, uh, conservative thought leaders, particularly those uh, closer to President Trump, but, but in no way exclusively, I think there is a very significant sense among those folks that fundamentally, uh, while we deplore the Russian action, while we certainly think there need to be consequences for that action, that at the end of the day, this is 
primarily Europe's war, and that they are very reluctant to have the U.S. more directly involved, very wary of Ukraine drawing us in um, for their own totally, I mean, if I were, you, if I were Zelensky, I'd be doing exactly uh, what, what, I, what he is doing right now, but that doesn't mean that <clears throat> we will perceive it to be in our interests. <clears throat> and actually, uh, Andrew Roberts mentioned in his very interesting opening remarks, he talked about Kissinger. Uh, Kissinger wrote an op-ed about Ukraine in the Washington Post about eight years ago that I would thoroughly associate myself with, in which he took a very realist Kissingerian, one might say, a view of this conflict, um, uh, wanted Ukraine not in NATO. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, um, again, I, I don't want to do anything to minimize um, uh, a, uh, the, the total unacceptability of Russia's behavior here, uh, or B, um, the fact that uh, Putin may be being driven by things other than just realist considerations, in other words, um, <clears throat> Green, dreams of a great Russian empire. But I do think that there are uh, historical, and I'm really just paraphrasing Kissinger here, uh, relationships between Russia and Ukraine that made uh, our kind of NATO dance with them as unrealistic as that might have been, uh, very provocative and unnecessarily, to the point that folks like me who were very suspicious, it was very hard to assess Russian intentions because I felt that we had been provocative uh, toward them for so long that I completely understood why they sort of found some of our meddling in Ukraine to be uh, totally unacceptable from a Russian nationalist perspective. Um, now, having said that, you know, so therefore, therefore, if you kind of feel like, well, there's a point uh, that they're making, it's, it's very hard to assess, well, am I dealing with a kind of bloodthirsty maniac or am I dealing with somebody who has legitimate uh, security concerns? Again, as, as Andrew touched upon, it may even be uh, we may have to wait to the historians before we really get a definitive answer on what that that looks like. But I, I will say there is not an appetite in the U.S. to take a primary place uh, in these conflicts. Um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be, and, and John and I talked about this, uh, a kind of nuclear backstop to things uh, going really, really haywire in Europe, because I think we will continue to be that. But I think the, the real kind of, to, to sum up an, an opening remark, uh, the kind of fundamental change here is going to be that Europe is going to be in the front of European security. And I think that, that overall that is a, a very good development, even though this short-term development that's brought it about uh, is highly deplorable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Two points I would like to make. First of all, right now, the Russian president is creating the Ukrainian nation that he denied it exists. So it's, it's a good job on his part, <laughs> to be honest. And, I think if you look at the history of Poland, which has a very intertwined history with Ukraine over the past couple of centuries, Poland disappeared the map a few times, but they always came back. And Ukraine might have a similar experience, and that's a very powerful foundation of national identity. So in that sense, I think, um, obviously, the Ukrainian nation existed before, but the modern Ukrainian nation is being born today. Uh, the second point I'm, I'll make is that um, the West has been uh, engaging in all different kinds of sanctions against Russia, which is, of course, justified, but it accelerates the replacement of Western infrastructure, especially in finance. You can cut off Russia from SWIFT. It's technically doable, but they will go somewhere else. Where they will go, who has the alternative infrastructure? That's China. So what we achieve is that basically we divert a significant part of Russian exports to Chinese financial infrastructure. We won't have any idea that who owns what, who pays whom, uh, whether there's any money laundering going on. I mean, good luck with uh, getting Chinese bank secrets. I mean, we have been struggling with Switzerland for decades to achieve that. I mean, imagine that doing that against China. Um, the third issue that struck me really hard was that how Europe was replacing its interests with values. Um, we haven't seen this before. Of course, everybody was preaching that the values are important and we should abide by the values, but at the same time, everybody was ready to do business with whomever uh, came across the board, regardless of the human rights record, stances on democracy, and so on and so forth. That has changed in some of the European countries, and I, I really agree with everybody who spoke before me that the change in Germany is dramatic. I think we, cannot, we can overestimate the importance of that flip that happened in Germany one and a half weeks ago. Uh, what is striking on the other hand is that um, 
I'm not really seeing that kind of enthusiasm on the American side, with all the respect to our friends, American friends here in the room. Uh, the Americans have been conspicuously silent on most of the issues regarding Ukraine. I do understand the political need after um, the start of the midterm campaign to make this a European affair. Last time the Americans tried that, we ended up with uh, American fighters bombing Serbian positions in Srebrenica and other places. So uh, I don't know if Europe is up to this challenge to manage uh, a war of such a scale in its immediate neighborhood. But um, the first occasion when the Americans really replaced interested values was when uh, the ban on Russian energy exports uh, was announced over the weekend. Uh, and obviously Boeing's not going to buy any titanium from Russia anymore. But I have a wait and see approach in that because it's great to say that, yeah, Germany is not going to buy any gas from Russia, but how are you going to power your homes next day? And obviously the voters are also concerned about that. They don't, they don't only want to feel nice about doing the right thing. They also want to, have, want to have a home which is heated and they want to drive their cars. And obviously that's quite unimaginable, un, unimaginable without uh, the cooperation with Russia at the moment. And this brings me to the public opinion in general. I think, um, if you look at how the Ukrainians flipped Western public opinion in a course of days to their side, that's truly remarkable. I mean, we've been talking about Russian propaganda for years and how successful it is and so on and so forth. And I, I really do not see Russian propaganda happening right now. They're being excluded. Their outlets are being shut down throughout the European Union. And also the Ukrainians are outdoing them by at least two magnitudes. If you look at Twitter, if you look at Facebook, if you look at President Zelensky's appearances in the House of Commons, the European Parliament, the German Bundestag, I mean, he's basically doing this from his bunker on Zoom, but it works. Now, the question is that for how long he can do this because they started to overdo this a little bit by blackmailing uh, Western public opinion to put pressure on their governments to introduce no-fly zones over Ukraine, for instance, which would be the start of the Third World War because then NATO would enter direct armed conflict with Russia. And, you know, that, that wouldn't last long. That might like something like 30 minutes and everything is over. Uh, and the final point uh, here is that we've been talking about EU strategic autonomy for years. Our prime minister has been talking about EU strategic autonomy for years. Now, I do not know about anyone who thinks this is doable at the moment. The first reaction was NATO, Americans come help us and you know, let's hope for the best. I don't think there's anybody out there, even those who have believed in EU strategic autonomy three weeks ago, that this is something on the table. This is something that we can even think about because it became quite obvious that we do not have the political will, we don't have the physical capacity. Of course, 2% is great, but NATO has been overriding the security thinking in all of the member states. And, you know, yeah, strategic autonomy is a nice thing, but it's, it's gone for the next 50 years at least, I guess. But maybe Rodrigo disagrees with me on that. I do. <laughs> That's great. I somehow disagree, indeed, with the last point. I also agree with a lot of uh, previous points that you made and uh, the other speakers made. First of all, thank you very much, Danube Institute, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and also to the other speakers. Um, uh, first, no one has a crystal ball. Uh, take my words with a sense of uh, prudence and modesty. And I hope especially to be wrong on many of them. Uh, what do I see? I see the first hybrid war that will set the standard of the next war for the next centuries. Uh, I see the possibility of having two failed states in the border of the European Union. Uh, with a lot of, for example, migration flows, what we see now might be the very, very beginning, the very small tip of the much larger iceberg. So that will be part of the game as well. Um, I also see, um, indeed, that uh, speaking about EU strategic autonomy, at least we can agree that in the last weeks, two weeks, it, the European Union and the European continent, as we knew it from the post-war, lost its virginity. At the age of 65, it was about time. Uh, and I think they did it a bit ruthlessly, but uh, effectively. And I think on, on, in many ways, things are not going to be the same before um, than before. Um, although I still have a bit of doubts about it, but indeed, I mean, there was a wake-up call, and it, I'm very happy to see that the European Union did not totally lose its instinct for survival. Uh, you can see it in the drastic change in Germany. You can also see in the fact that uh, everyone is ready to, to, to take its share of a sacrifice. I mean, those sanctions seem to work. 
they will be very painful on Russia, they will also be hurtful on us. And everyone is assuming in the next one, two, three years, we are all going to suffer from that. And again, that's also a very positive, it's a positive sign that we are ready to do some sacrifice. It also shows, you know, that again, we, we, we seem to be in a brain dead and we were less brain dead. Speaking about brain dead, this is the expression that Macron used to define NATO, uh, I think two or three years ago. Uh, I think NATO woke up from its coma and may also uh, wake up with a new setting, with a new philosophy, and maybe with a new pillar. And this is where I, I think uh, uh, there is a chance maybe for European strategy, uh, autonomic, um, strategic autonomy, sorry, that within NATO, I see it coming. If, I, if by, the, in, you know, by the end of the decade or even in the next five years, a majority of EU member states indeed spend 2% of their GDP and are really serious about rearming themselves, um, then I can see a NATO that is alive and a NATO where indeed, you know, the center of gravity is going to lie more on Europe than on the US. And I think that will be a good deal for everyone. That's basically what President Trump was calling ruthlessly, but also rightfully uh, during his mandate. So I see those things happening. Um, and for me, that will be a fair definition of EU strategic autonomy. So EU has its own, or even for example, like the, 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 this stupid dream of an EU army, uh, that no one believes that in the room. 27 serious European armies that are able to coordinate themselves or to, buy, to purchase uh, weapons together and to, again, indeed to coordinate themselves, that, that's, that seems realistic to me and that seems indeed uh, like a very good, a very positive development. Um, I'm also, I also have questions on sovereignty and especially nations, national sovereignty. If we have more European strategic autonomy, that might be also to the erosion of national sovereignty. Now that we reason more in terms of blocks, we are in the, in the very beginning of a war now. So now it's not the time to be smart, as Orban said, the time to be united. United means also that we will have less room of maneuver for nuances, for different approaches. It's basically you are against me or you are with me. And I'm also a bit afraid that in the long term, this is going to, to, um, to mean uh, to imply that within the European Union, you will have less room for diverging opinions, even less than now. It means maybe a more monolithic European Union. And it means maybe a union as well, where you know, like different opinions, even on social matters, might be less accepted. And of course, I'm thinking, first of all, in the first line about Hungary here. Um, and that makes, takes me also to another point, is that we, Europe woke up, the Western world woke up. Good news, but does that make us less woke? <laughs> and again, there I don't know. I don't know, because one thing is to stand up against Putin, the way the Western world, and actually part of the, the larger than the Western world did. Another one is to cancel Tchaikovsky's or to remove Dostoevsky from our shelves. And those things are happening as well. Uh, when I see this moral capitalism, I have mixed opinions on that, mixed feelings. On the other hand, on the one hand, I'm happy to see and I'm satisfied to see that some uh, big enterprises are ready to put, you know, like some ethical concerns above, you know, their profits. Fair enough. But it also depends on the, on the moral software that they have in mind. And if this moral software is the woke one that I'm starting to be worried. And again, imagine that that sets a precedent and in 10 years or in five years, a country, for example, adopts the, the, the laws on the protection of minors that Texas is adopting, that Florida is adopting, that Hungary already adopted, and they get canceled for that. That's also another option that I I mean, it came, it came to my mind, I hope, you know, again, uh, this, uh, this uh, right to be different and to think differently is not going to be uh, totally thwarted or undermined by notions of strategic autonomy. And again, last point also on this very virginal approach that the EU had. The EU, indeed, was not only free riding. Free riding is a euphemism. They were doing much more than that, not only trade, but they, they even allow itself in the last 10 to 20 years, the EU was thinking of itself like a moral authority, you know, like a primus inter pares, like a very nice referee, like the wise conscience 
uh, and the, the peaceful conscience, you know, that we are out of history now. So maybe the end of the end of history is the beginning now of this European strategic autonomy. But we are not yet there. And I see some, some signs, for example. Uh, two days ago, the European Commission published a communication on, uh, with a very uh, Twitter type of name. It was like, Repower EU. And basically, the message there is let's cut our dependence from Russian fossil fuels. Fair enough. But the other message was more renewables, more renewables. The quicker, the better. I mean, basically, this obsession with renewables energy is part of it's one of the reasons why this war caught us totally naked. And they still, so basically, the only underwear we had, they, apparently, they want to remove it as well. <laughs> so again, there, there is still a lot of naivete. And I have the impression that this very positive reaction that the Western world and the European Union had, I mean, is it going to thwart this naivete? Is it going to, to neutralize it? Or is it going actually to fuel it? Will we be more woke or less woke after this war? This is one of the questions I have in mind. Next question, maybe you want to react on this wait and see American politics, any of you? Yeah, I mean, I, I first I'll just pick up on, on something uh, that you said a little bit earlier. I, I think at a big level, again, to quote a great uh, a ruthless realist, um, Talleyrand, the former French foreign minister, who once said of a opponent's a reaction that it was, was worse than a crime, it was a blunder. And that's how I view what uh, Putin has done here. Um, I think he's made a a strategic mistake, regardless of me maybe not being as sanguine about this uh, general conflict or how it will resolve in the short term than, than some other folks on the panel are. But I, I think that th there is actually quite a lot of um, moral language I see being used out of the US. And uh, to some degree, it's understandable. And to some degree, I'm very concerned about it. Uh, the Kissinger op-ed I referenced uh, begins by talking about it doesn't really matter how this begins. This was written in 2014, but how it ends. And he sort of references that I've seen the U.S. in my you know post World War II lifetime go into four conflicts with great enthusiasm and go out with its tail between its legs at, at three of them at that point. Um, and uh, you know I worry that that morality rather than interest um, uh, has limited life uh, span as a you know fundamental. Uh, driver of, of human uh, action. Again, I think there is a, a split uh, between um, the Democrats and the Republicans to a degree, and also between a lot of the Republican establishment and the Republican grassroots and even Republican thought leaders on uh, this particular issue. Um, and I, I guess I further, uh, I, I'm just a little bit, um, I mean, one summary, a lot of us in the conservative movement, Ukraine was one of our main bad actors until very recently. Uh, they were the biggest contributor to the Clinton Foundation. They had deep relationships with Joe Biden's son, which is why, of course, Trump got in trouble for his phone call with Zelensky. So we haven't forgotten all that. I mean, in, in, at least some of us haven't forgotten all that. And a lot of the hysteria to say how much we have to love Ukraine. Um, I mean, and you know, again, without minimizing the wrongness of what Putin has done. Um, you know, this is not uh, the little sisters of the poor versus Adolf Hitler. This is a little bit more of a nuanced um, kind of conflict. And again, just my cold realist American heart, um, you know, sort of just wants us to approach it with the appropriate seriousness in that regard. So. Oh yeah, I, well, I want to say really two things. Um, the first is that there are going to be dramatic changes in defense spending, defense arrangements, and NATO as a result of what's just happened. The question is, which kind should they be? Um, first of all, I am very much against the division of NATO into an alliance in which uh, the United States has got a kind of equal partner in a Europe with, in, in a European Union which has its own army and strategic um, independence, so to speak, strategic autonomy. Why? First of all, because I, although I will subsequently say what I think should happen, I don't believe this will produce the right results. Um, an alliance of two almost equal powers will always be less um, united than w a, an alliance with one dominant power surrounded by other powers of less 
um, of less weight. That was the lesson for 40 years in the Cold War, in which everybody in Europe knew that they had to row together because the Americans wouldn't tolerate any serious dispute between two members of the alliance. And I think that that is a, a, a factor of life we have to take into account. And, and therefore, I don't believe if there were, so to speak, a, a, a greater and more independent European personal, uh, defense personality, I don't believe it would work well. I don't believe it would actually, that they it would spend the money necessary to have the degree of force, uh, and including conventional force, um, against the, the rest of the allies, against the Russians, which is our principal target. Um, I think that the, um, uh, the, the point that you, the points you make are, are, are very interesting, important, and fair ones, but the key thing for the Americans, uh, which I think they will institutionally remember, is that this crisis did not begin with the invasion of Ukraine. It began with the publication of a diplomatic note from uh, the Russian government to uh, the United States demanding the reversal of the end of the cold, the result of the Cold War and saying that all the countries which had joined NATO uh, after 1997 would have to withdraw. Uh, in other words, Ukraine was simply the first practical expression of a dramatic revanchism, um, which we really cannot accept. Now, does that mean that we are uh, uh, in a bellicose mood? No, it means we, we must look, and here's my positive side of things. Um, what is going to come about if we are sensible? In, in the, first of all, the Americans... Um, uh, have several traditions in foreign policy. And I'm not really meaning Republican, Democrat. You know what I mean. You're talking, you have the Jacksonian tradition and the Jackson, uh, uh, don't tread on me. Yes, that tradition is, as you say, disaffected from any serious commitment as a result of a, a, a military commitment, as certainly one that seems to risk a, third, a, a, um, a nuclear war, which I don't think it does, by the way, but that's another matter. But then there are the other traditions. There is the Hamiltonian tradition, which is committed to the idea that um, it's the end of the Cold War is a vital American strategic interest. It's not trivial, whether or not in a world in which China is becoming the most important power in the world, whether it does or not is another matter, when in such a world, the importance to the United States of having a Europe that is its best friend and not Russia's best friend becomes extremely important, more important than it's been since really the late 40s. So uh, that's the first point. How do we then distribute the powers and responsibilities? Well, I think the first thing is every member of NATO is going to have to spend more on conventional defense because we don't want to be in the trap we are now, in which whenever we have to respond to a Russian incursion of any kind, the, the first thing we have to say is, well, we're not, of course, going to do anything serious in here because it might lead to a nuclear war. That means you've got to have a lot more conventional forces on the ground in all the weak places than before. And that's why the Baltic states and not alone the Baltic states, are going to have to increase their defense, um, that's what I want, uh, men and materials. We nearly have to be able to, to fight that battle. It's why uh, all of the frozen conflicts are going to have to be looked at as occasions of much greater risk for the West than now. Now, um, uh, the, and I have another reason for arguing that NATO will therefore, well, NATO will therefore be as follows. It will be um, the Americans and the Europeans will work together to build up their conventional forces. In the final analysis, if those countries are invaded, the, the American deterrent, if the nuclear umbrella, will work against nuclear weapons. But as our current anxieties about nuclear weapons are showing here, we have to have conventional forces uh, strong enough to resist the Russians without recourse to nuclear weapons. That's going to be expensive but it's gonna be a great deal more expensive if we don't do it. You want to react, yeah, of course, uh, sure. Because the bigger is that I would like to talk a bit about how the woke nature of the media is influencing us right now. Uh, what you see on the internet at the moment is that companies are switching their logos to yellow and blue. 
Uh, they're giving political commentary on things that, I mean, McDonald's pulling out of Russia, I mean, commercially, does that make any sense? I don't think so, but it feels good for them. Or at least they try to pretend that they care, they, they follow the flow and so on and so forth. Now, rewind time a bit to the last summer when uh, Hungary was hosting the Euro Football Championships. And remember that what these companies were doing then, they were changing their logos to the rainbow flag all the time. And what frightens me a little bit is that the infrastructure seems not only to work, but it gets reinforced because now the entire West is on the right side of things. And it will become accepted to stone people to death before we had some kind of a trial, just because we don't like them, we have a different point of view. And since we are right, or we feel to be right in the case of Ukraine, this will be widely accepted. You know, that reminds me uh, the scene from the life of Brian, when everybody goes out to stone the guy to death, even before the rabbi says that they should stone him. And uh, this is a bit frightening for me, because if it's going to stay like that, and if we're going to enter the value-based debates on protecting the minors or what is a marriage and, you know, who should adopt kids and these kind of things, having such a reinforced weapon of correctness in the media uh, won't, won't help either of the sides, and especially it will disproportionately hurt the conservative side more. Remember the defenders of Snake Island, uh, who told the Russian warship to go to hell, and then we were told that all of them got killed. Turns out that they were not killed. Turns out that maybe the incident might ever happen. But you know, by that time, with the, life si the new cycle of half an hour and tweets coming out in every half a minute, nobody cared. They even printed the t-shirts about, you know, Russians, Russian warship go to hell. And, you know, if this is really nice looking from this side because we seem to be on the right side of his, history, or at least this is what we believe in, but the time might very early come when we will be on the wrong side of the history from the majoritarian point of view with all the ideas that the conservative movement is trying to put on the table at the moment. And that concerns me very much. And, and I'm concerned, just that if I can jump in here, that, that um, all of the moralizing discussions that you're talking about are concerning to me. Um, I'm glad that we're doing economic sanctions. I, I prefer those as <laughs> to, to military weapons at this point. But having just lived through two years of COVID insanity, I have zero confidence in our leadership's ability to appropriately judge second order effects of what we're doing. And that's why the moralism makes me very, very nervous. Because I think our, again, cold-hearted realist interest is to send a message to Russia and Putin that the cost of doing this is going to be higher than the benefit. And that's it. Like, I don't care beyond that so that you won't do it again or even think of doing it again. You know, this notion that like, oh, we're just going to throw all this stuff in and, you know, drive Russia into the ground, like, it makes me very, very nervous. Very, very nervous that there's going to be a bunch of unintended blowback, that we have no idea what it's going to look like. Maybe it's rapprochement between Russia and China in much more fundamental ways. I, I just, I'm concerned that we're not thinking about this in as strategic a way as we need to be thinking about it. And I think there are ways to make this painful for Russia, but we're not doing, I'm seeing a lot of stick. And if you, you know, read Sun Tzu, he talks about building a golden bridge for your enemy to retreat back across. And I don't see us doing enough of that. You know, we wanna, my view is, want to make it as easy as possible. I don't know that it's possible at this point, but for Russia to save some sort of face and get out of Ukraine, that's our core goal here, strategically. Um, and even already to, to, to pave the way towards a stable treaty with right. Russia. Right. And maybe we can also learn from the mistake from the 90s. Was it a good idea to humiliate Russia the way we did? Right. For example, I mean, if, I mean, they, they, they can be extremely paranoid, and I like very much, Mr. Roberts, the, the, the example that you gave that they, 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 will up, they will come up, up to Spain just yeah. to live, for the Pyrenees, yeah. believing that Spain can attack them. It's true. Yeah. But we also have, I mean, now is not a time for self-criticism. That will come later. But indeed, at some point, we will have to, to think about those things. And it's true that I'm, I, I totally share this, this uh, the, the existential and the moral fear that you, that you explained, Martin, because it's true that now is the, the moment of oligopolies, the, the moments of blocks. And blocks are not there to think in nuances. Uh, with nuances, and again, at some point, I mean, this, this moralism, this uh, coming from capitalism, from public opinion, from published opinion, I mean, also can backfire, can backfire. And also, you know, can also be very 
they are missing with some other tendencies. I mean, something that also, I mean, really, uh, I was about to, 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 I was very nervous about it and uh, v very upset. But two days ago, for example, in Spain, the Spanish government put on the table a plan to fight for, uh, against machism, to combat machism, and to uh, pursue gender equality. And the plan has been funded with 20 billion euros. So we're speaking about a country which is, uh, has a debt of 120% of GDP, uh, who basically has an army that is, has a rachitic budget, and still the government put on the table a plan that is basically two times the budget of the army, two times the budget of the army, to fight a problem that is a windmill that doesn't exist, because believe it or not, even according to the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union, which is a bit woke, huh? Spain is the less machist country in Europe, even less than Sweden and less than any others. I know we have a different reputation, but the facts are different. And still, I mean, with now geopolitics and the tragic history knocking at our door, our prime minister did that, and no one says a word. No one says a word. Again, is that also, for example, like the woke privilege that we might have for the next five, ten years? is extremely, extremely worrying. And also speaking about EU strategic autonomy, uh, John, I, uh, I, I, you're right, I, will, I, I prefer to have a dominant power and it will be the US and whatever happening will be the US for a long time. I also think that the US prefers maybe to have a dominated power that at least is more powerful than what it is now. Because so far, I mean, we are naked, we have yes, nothing, we were free true. riding. And so at least if we can balance a bit this, this, uh, this relation, I think, it's, it's good for everyone as long as they don't become rivals. I th and again, within right. NATO, I think that's maybe the, the best compromise we have. And also speaking about EU strategic autonomy and my worries also about the erosion of national sovereignty, my conception of strategic autonomy is that indeed 27 strong sovereign yeah. nations, whenever they have a, a common enemy and a common interest, can do much more than a centralized EU strategic autonomy. Yeah. If it's over-centralized, then it will be a disaster because no one in Brussels, no one is able to even start centralizing that. The best thing that the EU can do is to put money on the table. Yes. And very, very low common, uh, common framework that is very flexible. The rest, leave it to the pros, to the pros leave it to the national member states. I, I just want to say, I very much agree with that, those last remarks. That's exactly what I think. But um, there is another point which I think is worth making, may, an ironic one, which is that the end of the Cold War until the other day liberated the politicians of the West, particularly on the left, to pursue the most absurd and dangerous utopian schemes. Virtually everything that happens now in these grand gatherings of politicians in, the, in peace is to produce some, uh, something which will cost enormous amounts of money and yet not have, as far as one can see, many benefits. Of course, it avoids some dangers, some of which are mythical. So, I mean, I think the, the climate is, an, is a result of that debate. The creation of a completely new man and woman in a, in a, a, of a non-sexist kind is a completely new one. The, the gender identity problem, which is now being imposed on populations which don't even understand what the argument is being made. Those things were the product of complacency uh, at the end of the Cold War. I think that now we actually do face a real challenge and a real enemy, we may, as a result, become much more realistic. But uh, the, uh, part of the answer to that may be given today because I think there's a discussion in Brussels over what to do about Hungary. And I'd have to say I would begin to despair if they continue to press ahead with what is a fundamentally frivolous ideological uh, fun game for the left when we're dealing with really much more serious questions. Yeah, Oh, gentlemen, you're putting the role of the moderator in the brackets <laughs> for me. But, uh, let's go on for, for next question. Uh, let's, let's concentrate on the um, security guarantees and the future of such guarantees in, in the international system. Well, there was an agreement of 1994, the, the so-called Budapest Memorandum, where uh, Ukraine gave up its nuclear capacity or, or possibility. And the uh, United States, uh, Great Britain, and Russia guaranteed Ukraine's territorial integrity. Well, then Russia seized Crimea in 2014, which was already uh, a crack in this kind of 
guarantee system. And now they attacked Ukraine, but well, non, neither United States, neither Great Britain helped them because they didn't want to start a third world war, right? So what will be the future of such guarantees? Because who, who will guarantee anything? What will be uh, uh, the binding force of such agreements? Because if nobody abides to these agreements, then they don't really have any force. <laughs> What, what do you think on this regard? Maybe let's start on this on this end. Uh, thank you. Okay. Oh, it's me. I will. I will uh, bring it. It's better now. Thank you. Um, one uh, ten billion dollar question again. Twenty billion uh, euro question like the plan in Spain uh, on on on, uh, on gender equality. Um, just just two things. Obviously, I mean, this, this Budapest Agreement, one of the three countries that was supposed to protect Ukraine. One of the th Hello. Uh, one of the three countries that was, <laughs> that was supposed to, um, to protect Ukraine was Russia. So obviously, they didn't really stick to their, to their, to their commitments. Um, real politics, I mean, I also, I mean, an agreement that has been signed in 94, you know, uh, it becomes caduc, becomes obsolete, obviously, I mean, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the face of geopolitics. Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but let me just point out something. Article 42.7 of the Treaty of the European Union. This is an article that is very important. Everyone totally overlooked, totally forgot about it. But it's basically the type of NATO clause among European countries, among EU countries. This article has been triggered yesterday by Sweden, uh, Finland and Sweden because uh, they are EU member states, but they are not NATO member states. And now they also feel the heat and say, oh, damn, we would maybe like to be protected as much as the Baltics or, uh, or, or Poland is now, or Hungary is. I mean, the, the NATO shield seems to be now an added value, a clear added value. Uh, so they triggered it yesterday. That, I think, is going to be a nice test. Um, Let's hope that nothing is going to escalate more than that. But if it does, and Finland and Sweden are attacked, and they are good targets because they are not NATO member states, what is going to happen? What is going to happen with the other EU member states, and by the way, also with NATO, because de facto, de facto, this quasi-NATO clause, you know, also applies de facto to, um, uh, to NATO as well. So we did also serve as a, as, as a shield to be, will, will have the, the same legal, you know, uh, binding nature than the Budapest Compromise. I think this is one of the tests that we will have on the table very soon. So Article 42.7 of the Treaty of the European Union might be the sexiest and most quoted article in the next six months, although no one ever quoted it before. I think the main problem with the Budapest Memorandum was that <clears throat> if you think about Teddy Roosevelt, who said that speak softly and carry a big stick, uh, the U.S. laid down the stick quite early, latest in 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea. And um, I think the Russians are smart in a way that they can read the West very effectively. And I think they noticed that Jan Stoltenberg said at least three times a week that NATO is not going to protect Ukraine no matter what. I mean, I think that's quite clear to the Russians that what they can do and what they cannot do. And this comes down to the no-fly zone. This comes down to weapons shipments. This comes down to the, to the Poles trying to make the Americans responsible for handing over the MiG-29 to Ukraine and all these kind of things. <clears throat> so it's, it's a bit like how the Biden administration approaches the JCPOA negotiations. At the beginning, they said that there's going to be an agreement with Iran no matter what. Now, obviously, the Iranian is going to play that hand quite effectively because they know that the other party wants an agreement at the end. So that's not how you negotiate, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think, and, and uh, your point being duly taken, I, I think, unfortunately, the U.S. for quite a long time has been far too um, expansive with the alleged security guarantees that we've been throwing around. I actually agree that weakness is quite provocative. And I think one really, really big form of weakness is what we do in the US we would call your mouth is writing checks that your body can't cash, um, kind of colloquially. Um, and uh, you know what we need to do in the US is we have not reevaluated a lot of these things since the Cold War. We have these mutual defense compacts with Bolivia and places like this that in no real sense you know, would 
U.S. forces and the U.S. public actually be um, okay with sending a bunch of Americans to die over Bolivia, right? It just, it, that's the reality. It wouldn't happen. I think Europe is different. I think Europe, there is a, a special relationship there. But I think we need to be much more crisp in the United States about defining who these are, what these defense arrangements exactly look like, have us a public, you know, raise its hand in some meaningful metaphorical way and say, yes, um, we are signing up to do this. Uh, you know, that we're signing up that there is a mutual defense and mutual interest. And again, Europe strengthening its own defense makes it easier to do that because then there is a little bit more mutuality in that type of a relationship rather than just the U.S. kind of carrying everything. Because the problem is, you know, it is the most weak thing. It's it's much better that we don't even have a quasi security guarantee with Ukraine than that we sort of play footsie with. Oh well, we're gonna you know we'll take care of it, but then Russia can see that we won't really. That is that is showing, you know, a lack of seriousness, a lack of resolve. So what we need to do is develop very very bright red lines and then stick to those lines. And that needs to be uh, the position going forward, and that's going to mean that we have to reevaluate where our core strategic interest is in a way that I don't feel that we've adequately done since the Cold War, at least from a U.S. perspective. Yeah. No, but the red line, the war in Ukraine was one of such red lines. No? Well, but not, no, I mean, I think it was a sort of, it was a p purplish line, right? Like, yeah, there's, it was in the same way that we told Putin, I mean, not quite as because there was more of a of the actual agreement. Yeah, well, we're not going to expand NATO East, you know, but there was no piece of paper behind it. You know, we don't, they're, they're not in NATO, right? So I think you can make an argument that, yes, there was the agreement. And then somebody can say, well, yeah, but it wasn't an agreement agreement, right? You can just, you, you, we can't have that. We can't have that type of ambiguity. It's got to be totally clear. You're either in the club or you're out of the club um, and exactly what that's going to entail. Um, and I can tell you from a U.S. public perspective, uh, it certainly was not clear with respect to Ukraine. And I think, and, and Russia is looking at that going, well, we have these, you know, we have a bigger strategic interest from their perspective in what happens in Ukraine than the Americans do. And so again, you know, when we're very promiscuous with these sorts of security guarantees or quasi guarantees, but don't actually intend to back those up, that is the worst type of thing, better than we not, not even pretend at all, so. Um, if you look at the, which, uh, you know, obviously is a bit um, uh, egoistic of me to suggest this, if you look at the article that Tamash Orban and I wrote uh, a month ago, and we didn't um, reach the conclusion that there should be um, uh, and more to the finish for Ukraine, we said two things. The most important we said a number, but I'll boil them down. The most important thing is to demonstrate to the Russians that the idea of redrawing the security map of Europe is a delusion and will not be, we will not involve in it, we will stop it. The second was not that Ukraine must join NATO. It, it is, it, we said that neutrality was a choice. Now, exactly, we had a rather complicated method of dealing with that. But nonetheless, we made it plain that from the standpoint of the US, as well as from Russia, a neutral Ukraine would not necessarily be a bad thing, provided it was in the context of a clearly strengthened Western position in Europe in general. That was the point, and that's still the point. Now, um, uh, I don't know how this war is going to end, but if it ends with a, a Ukrainian, independent Ukrainian state of some kind, geographically different probably from the present. And, and, and that state will, as a part of peace negotiations, demand and receive something like security guarantees. Uh, what must they be? Well, the paradox is that it might be a guarantee from NATO I mean, that is to say, who is going to guarantee the security of this state? It would have to be an agreement between Russia and the West. I would say NATO rather than any other independent country, slightly stronger than the Budapest Memorandum, which, of course, is the argument against what I'm saying here. Uh, but that is the important thing. And I will make one other point. 
among the things, the ironic results of Putin's action is that virtually all of the states which had lost all hope of joining the EU or NATO are now clamoring to join. Now, uh, that tell, should remind you of something. It is not true that the Americans and the Europeans pushed NATO membership on, on those countries. What happened was everybody who joined NATO was clamoring to join long before they were allowed to. The conditions for joining were, first of all, to make serious reforms, both politically and economically, before being allowed to join. And those changes were accepted by the Russians in a series of agreements between NATO, the Americans, the Europeans, and the West. Now, you may say, now, what was the big change? The big change was that Yeltsin and the people like Andrei Kazirev went out, and that people like Putin and, um, and um, uh, Lavrov came in. And, and they, they, were greater, they, they were greater Russian nationalists who wanted to reconstitute the Russian Empire. That's the problem. And if we don't acknowledge that, we keep blaming ourselves for things. Yes, we make mistakes, but we didn't, we didn't set out to humiliate the Russians. They, um, they decided to interpret as humiliation things that they had agreed to in the course of, t of time because they were weak. One thing, John, that I'd, I'd definitely agree with you on that I'd, I'd highlight because I think it's a, a secret weapon that we're not thinking about is I think the big, if I look as an American, the, the one big strategic concern we have here is that we're not, we don't want uh, Russia to redraw these boundaries of Europe by force. But I think one way you can do that without even firing a shot is just to make it very clear, starting now, by the way, that we're just never going to recognize what they're doing here, like period. Like you don't need to actually even engage, just like you want to send your your Ukrainian folks without with Russian passports to the US, we're not accepting those, right? Like there's all sorts of things you can do that don't involve weaponry that just basically say, look, we can outweigh you on this. You can you can do all this stuff. We're not gonna pay any attention to it. We're not we're not gonna sort of like with Crimea where we said, you know, okay, fine, like we don't really care. It's 90% ethnically Russian or whatever. Um, just say, no, we're not recognizing this. And then that sort of, I think that can be a very powerful deterrent toward future misbehavior. I mean, it has to be pooled with other things, but... Yeah. Other things like not cancelling Tchaikovsky, yeah. um, not, not telling the Russians that they're pariahs forever, right. but telling them they're a great civilization, they're part of our civilization, and that we want them to rejoin and we'll welcome them. I mean, that's yeah. one element in this. We can't... We're sure. driving the Russians into, um, into supporting Putin out of... Well, Right. A, yeah. Well, this it's is foolish. my concern. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my last question before going on and open the floor for the public. Uh, so if, if you say that, well, Crimea was kind of, yeah, okay-ish, and then, well, Budapest Memorandum was, uh, well, it's kind of a bluff. Nobody really believed that we should, first of all, that it, it would be happen that somebody would attack Ukraine and then that we need to, to protect Ukraine. But then, um, and now we are saying, keep saying that, well, it's not, Ukraine is not worse, that we, we, we start a third world war. Um, well, and if Russia attacks, let's say, Estonia and um, uh, saying that they are protecting the Russians living there, uh, is Estonia worse, worse it to start a third world war or if they attack Finland? Uh, so who, who tells us what, uh, what is the correct thing to do? What, what, what was the, um, uh, the start of the Third World War or preventing the Third World War? So where, where are these limits, the red lines which, <laughs> which you were talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah, since I think you're directing this maybe to me first. Um, I mean, to me, NATO is a red line still. Now, having said that, I probably, for this very reason, would have retrospectively, I think for Eastern Europe, which was not a Russian speaking area or historically in any way part of Russian civilization, I think it was appropriate to bring them under that umbrella. I have a little bit more mixed feelings about having done this, even though, and I'm not an expert in, in the Baltics, but they were certainly separate in some fundamental ways, but maybe a little more integrated with Russian civilization in other ways. So maybe retrospectively, we should have, shouldn't have done that, but I think NATO does have to be a very hard red line, just because historically it, it has been. And I think it's a very clear club where you're either in or out. So that's how you deal with that. 
well, okay, that's the question of kind of morality that, yeah, we, we should. But if it happens, we'll need to stand up for, for Lithuania, let's say, and, and go against uh, Russia. I think we will. I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think we will. I think so. <laughs> for the record. For the record. <laughs> no, I think so. Again, and um, NATO is a red line. I also tend to believe that EU is a red line, or not as red maybe as NATO, but it was it's much redder now than two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but three weeks three weeks ago, no one, no one would have thought that it would have had a geopolitical or a defense implication. It does have it. Again, I don't want to be too legalistic, but you have this Article 42, uh, Paragraph 7. And again, from a geopolitical point of view, it seems now it makes a difference. I mean, to attack the EU or not to attack the EU seems to me also like a red line. So I think there, mm. indeed, there is a, I, I, I would have little doubts about it. And also, the, there is also, I mean, let, let me come back to this concept of legitimacy. Uh, we all agree here that Crimea or Estonia are totally different cases. And if we can certainly discuss the legitimacy of Crimea, there's li very little to discuss about the legitimacy of Estonia or the other Baltic republics there. Right. So again, uh, that would be uh, one more red line that's uh, in, in my view. Yeah, I mean, OTAN, no, OTAN, sorry for my uh, Latino-French uh, <laughs> spelling, but basically NATO is acting now. I mean, they are patrolling. You have, uh, they are, it's basically on its toes now. So basically, it's almost ready to do that. Also, I mean, another uh, important aspect that I don't really master, so I just want to mention it, but the way, for example, Turkey is reacting now on the straight, you know, like this Montreux uh, agreement, you know, that they just basically applied. I mean, it shows that basically now everyone is showing its teeth to the possibility that you are pointing out. And so there, I mean, uh, with all the, also all the precedents, the very positive precedents of a common unity and strong, you know, like, um, so it's not soft powered, but hard powered that the EU was showing and Europe was showing and the Western world was showing in the last two weeks. I think there, this is the red line that Russia shouldn't cross because otherwise, yes, it will be a third world war, but they are very, very likely to lose it as well. So I see several, so red lines, purple lines, and the general context <laughs> that, you know, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will confirm the possibility that, yes, mm. uh, if they attack uh, one of those countries that you mentioned, that's it. Now we go. Um, I, of course, agree. Uh, the difference with Ukraine and Crimea and Georgia, for that instance, is was they were never members of these Western integration structures. Nobody took responsibility for them on, from our side. This was what the 2008 Bucharest NATO summit was about, that these countries were told that you are not in and you will be not be in in the near foreseeable future. And Russia understood that once again, and they went after Georgia first, they went after Ukraine second, and they might go after others if they have the physical capability to do so, about which I have doubts at the moment. Um, but the point is that I think the message of NATO and EU membership at the end of the day is that the West stops here. You know, from your eastern border, that's something different. And uh, it's really interesting that when President Trump was inaugurated, there were these debates of uh, whether he would fulfill his Article 5 commitments, should push come to shove. And at the end of the day, it turned out to be that this is not a question. And, you know, are we, are though, are the progressive press is questioning President Biden on whether he would, you know, fulfill his Article 5 commitments in a way they did with President Trump? Of course they don't. So I think it's quite clear. And if you look at the military deployments, if you look, if you look at the exercises, if you look at the British Challenger tanks in Estonia and, and these kind of things, it's, it's very visible where the West stops. Unfortunately for the Ukrainians, they are on the other side. And nobody, nobody takes responsibility for them. And, and that makes my heart beat because it's a very similar experience what we had in 1956. Right. Everybody says that, okay, take on the Russians, fight them, and you know, we're gonna help you. And when people ask that, okay, and what do you do for us? I mean, nothing, we're just gonna root for you, go ahead. And you know, it's disappointing, it is disappointing. And it really undermines the credibility of us at the end of the day because, um, and I'm really not trying to put the blame on either of the parties for the war, so don't get me wrong. But these kind of you know, approaches to proxy wars, because obviously this is a proxy war for NATO, it's not a proxy war to, uh, to Russia. And we've seen many of these in the Cold War, to be honest, from Vietnam to, to Angola. 
Um, so that hasn't changed that much. And we seem to forget that we've seen this before. The difference is that it's much closer to our borders. And when it comes to the refugees, which uh, uh, Rodrigo mentioned, I mean, Poland, Poland accepted over a million people in the course of two weeks. Um, I read a very interesting letter yesterday. I, I cannot tell you that who wrote it, uh, but the point was, uh, it was about the German, German uh, media criticizing Hungary for the treatment of refugees who come from Ukraine. And the point was that, you know, back in the days in 2015, uh, the point was that we had uh, 150,000 people coming and we had a quota of debate on that, which basically almost fractured the European Union over the replacement of the 40% of those 160,000 uh, people. And now the bad guys, Poland and Hungary, has accepted like one and a quarter million of people in two weeks. Right. And still we get blamed for being inhuman towards these people, despite of all the help which is being provided on the border. Of course, we can always do more, but the general attitude of these countries is very much different because the situation is different. We are the f first safe country, to be honest. We have a legal obligation. We have a moral obligation. This is not about asylum shopping. This is not about picking, handpicking a country where you would live. This is about saving your life. That's and right. this is why our responsibility is much right. more different than it was back in 2015. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think on that point, um, I think the model should be how the West reacted to the 56ers who came out. There was a, an international conference which made it possible for people to go all around the world, um, in particularly I mean, Australia, New Zealand, the English-speaking world in particular, but not only the English-speaking world. And frankly, nowadays, when we think about the 56 emigration in Britain, we are astonished at the benefits it brought to my, my country, astonished. And there was a powerful letter signed by the most amazingly distinguished list of names, thanking the British people on the 50th anniversary of 1956, letter of the Times. Um, so I think that's, that's terribly important how we handle it. We should handle it in exactly the same way. And, and I frankly think that as with Hong Kong, um, um, the opinion polls in Britain suggest that people coming to Britain from Hong Kong as a result of what the Chinese have done, destroying the freedom of that society, would be welcome. Astonishingly high numbers in opinion polls. And I think the same would be true here. Uh, and, I, it's, um, and I think those of us, and I'm one, who have a, taken the restrictionist view of immigration should be very happily say that this is one of those, I hope, rare occasions um, three times in the last 50 years, really, um, in, in which uh, we, we say we're very happy to make exceptions. Uh, there is one rule, that, and the second point, that briefly, there is one rule, um, red line rather, which has changed. Um, it used to be the case that we would say that you couldn't attack uh, a nuclear, a country which had nuclear weapons was too dangerous. We are now saying, as a result of this conflict, that you can't resist a country armed with nuclear weapons. That's too dangerous. Oh, sure, um, the, the country which is actually being invaded might be allowed to resist, although some of the things that are being said about the possible use of tactical nuclear weapons and germ warfare suggest that that, particular, that further red line is being erased. But I do not think we would like a world in which it could be said that if you get a nuclear weapon, that any uh, that uh, any no country is safe um, from your depredations. We have to find some way of re reinstalling that red line because that's a big change, a very big change, particularly in the light of the negotiations with Iran, where Iran will be a country with nuclear weapons and ambitions to well, openly expressed ambitions to destroy Israel and um, expressions which are somewhat covert and guarded about the rest of the Arab world, the sunny Arab countries. Yeah, I, I think there's actually an important point, but I think the thing that muddies it as it does so much with Ukraine is, look, Solzhenitsyn thought Ukraine was part of Russia, as well as many other Russian dissidents, okay? So what you've got here is, as, as totally immorally as Putin has handled it, you've got a boundary dispute, you know, in a civil, this, in a way that's totally different for like Hungary or the Czech Republic. Nobody says that these were Russia, okay? They just weren't historically ever. For Ukraine, you know, you can sort of have these arguments and that's where it muddies the, yeah. the, the issue of, it is a very dangerous precedent that we don't want to set of saying, well, if you've got a nuclear weapon, you can just do whatever, right? That will wind up very, very badly. 
Um, but again, when, when we have these ambiguities, that's where we get into trouble. And what we need to make sure is that we're drawing very, very bright, very, very clear lines so that we minimize that to the greatest extent possible. So, so the last question after my last question. <laughs> uh, is using nuclear weapons is a red line? Did I understand correctly? So if Russia would use, hopefully not, but if they would use nuclear weapons in, in Ukraine, what, would, what, what will the West do? Well, at this point, I think, uh, it, well, I don't know the answer to that question. It seems to me it's very hard to suggest that having seen such ruthlessness deployed against a country which cannot really fundamentally in the end resist them, they would nonetheless, um, um, but we can't say that they wouldn't use those weapons against us in the event we tried to intervene. I, I, I doubt that they would actually, but in the circumstances you're describing, uh, reason, very reasonably asking me to think about. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. I think the answer would have to include that in some sense the world would have to be organized to tell the Russian people that their government was an illegitimate one in every sense and that it, it, it was a Nazi government. Supposing the Nazis had somehow survived the war, what would we we'd be doing? Well, that's the kind of question we would have to ask and I don't have a ready answer to it. Very quickly. Last week, there was an um, unfortunate comment by Friedrich Merz, who is now the chairman of the CDU, who said that an attack on a Ukrainian nuclear power plant would trigger Article 5 in NATO because that would directly endanger the security of NATO. Now, the reaction of the German political elite was that, you're stupid. That's not like that. And I think this basically sums up that what we would do if Russia would deploy tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, I think we would closely monitor the situation with deep concern. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that, I mean, that would be a dramatic. Ask. I don't know what it would definitely change the U.S. calculus. Uh, I think you know using anything like that, and we, which is why I think Putin is a master of dark arts. You know, professionally by training is much more likely. You've seen all this chatter about the biological labs. So you might see a, a deniable biological sort of thing. like I don't think he would be so. Overt. I think it's too risky for him, and there's other ways that he can mess around with the Ukrainians without doing that. Actually, just to strengthen that argument, uh, he's never actually threatened to use nuclear weapons in response to anything we might do. He made dark, unspecified menaces, and we said, oh, that means he'll use nuclear weapons. So we're, he's relying on us to um, interpret anything he says or does in the most dangerous way to us. And... Uh, that's a dangerous game, but so far he's playing it well. Okay, let's uh, let's open the floor to the public. And um, yeah, the lady here in the first row, please introduce yourself and um, and ask your question, not a comment. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Bara Nyudit, and I am curious. Both with uh, Rodrigo and and Martin, you talked a little bit about um, the wokeness of the corporations. Um, and, and moral judgments now being bandied about and, and how potentially, um, you know, this is kind of going with the same morality that we all have personally at the moment, but it could go the other way on a different occasion, and, and that's truly dangerous. I, I fully agree. I, I'm curious, though, if you look at the monetary um, aspect of it, because you both said, well, what, you know, what corporate or monetary interest is there for McDonald's or or Coca-Cola to, to come out of, of, of Russia. Well, there is one actually. It happened after the, um, the ruble you know, is, is being made worthless. And therefore, what value was the rubles that McDonald's gonna earn on their, on their hamburger going to be to them? And this is very true, I think, if you look at, at corporate wokeness altogether, if you look at the way they've fallen onto any of the climate change topics or any of it, it tends to follow the, but still follows the money. It's just that they realize that social um, acceptability is important in terms of having, of gaining their customers. And so as they are gaining their customers, uh, it, do you not think that, uh, they're going to fall onto whatever topic it is in terms of wokeness and, and following what they think the majority opinion is, which is going to be most attractive to their clients. I think that comes down to the market in the way that, you know, 
the decision whether you buy a bottle of Coke, you know, whether it's because they support gay people, climate change, Ukrainians, yeah. whatever, or because it tastes nice. You know, if the first one is overriding the second one, and obviously to raise your own individual utility, you will be buying a Coke, even if you don't like it, just to support the case. Um, my personal opinion is that it goes against human rationality, at least for what I have learned. Uh, but I see frightening signs that this might become the new normal. Now, I don't think that corporations who are, first of all, responsible for their shareholders have to have a political opinion. Uh, but they do, and uh, if it pays, then obviously they're going to do that. Um, I think the problem to understand this will be on, a, on another level that is, you know, whether these fiscal motivations and fiscal incentives will be overridden by something else, and whether that's going to be sustainable, because as far as I know, the Coke has tasted the same for the past 125 years, but uh, the world has changed a lot in between. And, uh, you know, not today it's climate change, gay rights, Russia, but God knows what's going to be tomorrow. And that way they're going to risk to lose their consumers because public opinion can now shift in two days. And, you know, if all of a sudden it turned out that Ukraine has been committing war crimes and everything that Putin was saying was true, which is obviously not, but let's pretend for a moment it is, then Coca-Cola will be standing there saying that, yeah, okay, how we can revert on that? and how I can sell my product once again, despite the fact that it stays the same, but people have different attitudes towards me because I, I fall in victim of a, of a big lie and I was not cautious enough. So I think the problem is not with companies taking political views, that's strange for me, but people can disagree with me on that, but how this whole, how this whole hysteria, if I may use that word, operates and how quick it is and how impossible it is to do anything against it. I mean. Final note before I shut up. Um, I was a bit surprised that after the few past few years, uh, when Ukraine was claiming that if Russia is going to attack from the east, Hungary is going to attack from the west, and we're going to take back our ancient lands. I mean, I was surprised that that didn't came up on Twitter. It was, you know, so easy, so, so, so obvious. Fortunately, it didn't happen. But you know, once some somebody puts that out on a Twitter, and the Ukrainian minister, Ministry of Defense retweets it. I mean, people will just set the Hungarian houses on fire in Ukraine, and you cannot undo that. And you know, this is this is this is frightening. So if it was, it was the radio for Hitler, now it's Twitter for everybody else who wants to be like that. And once again, don't get me wrong; I'm not liking Hitler to the Ukrainians by any means. That's, that's not my intention. No, but uh, I saw on Twitter, by the way, some fake news saying that the Hungarians will organize a referendum. The Hungarians in Ukraine will organize a referendum. Mm -hmm. That's not the same spark that you mentioned, but it could be considered a spark. Of course, it was denied bluntly you know, by the Hungarian government from minute one, and so maybe again it neutralized it, but still a risk, I'm afraid. Um, just to come back to your comment and to your question, I think the, it relies, I mean, the key word you mentioned is social acceptability, uh, which for me is, um, is a concrete example of how cultural wars can be very, very useful, because at the end, I mean, can conservatives also colonize the software that those companies, that this social, what, of what social acceptability means and so what those companies are going to accept or not? I think that's the key because indeed, let's also go back to the example of the protection of minors. Now, the software is non-discrimination. Everyone can be whoever he wants to be. Will we manage one day to show, for example, that the trans ideology, first, is absolutely sectarian and second, is a threat for children and for and for, uh, for 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 teenagers, the minute we'll accept that, maybe we will be able also to push those points. But in the meantime, I mean, we are extremely, extremely far from this point. Extremely far, and the public opinion might be volatile. It might change very, very quickly. But in times of war, it tends to become more radical on those things, and so it means that maybe this is going to be the the social standard for the next two, three years. How many years can a country, a small country of 10 million inhabitants like Hungary survive, for example, the fact that Twitter says, oh, I will no longer operate in Hungary? Because here we're speaking about Coca-Cola, about Louis Vuitton and things like that. Okay, fine. Well, you can live without a Louis Vuitton bag and without Coca-Cola for some time. It might even be a very healthy thing to do. But the way, the way Twitter treated already Donald Trump, for example, they... Imagine that they just disconnect a 9 million uh, inhabitants country from, uh, from Central Europe. They could do it. For them, it's not a cost. For Hungary, it will be a huge cost. 
think about Google, much worse, much worse. They could do these things. And so that's why here again, again, I'm also very, very much afraid of a, of a very centralized and unified European Union where those nuances no longer exist. And by the way, they no longer exist. The reason why, the reason why Hungary doesn't get its 7 billion euros from the recovery plan are officially <coughs> unknown. Officially, it's a bit the rule of law. It's a bit corruption. When you read between the lines, when you scrap a bit, it is obvious that this Hungarian law on the protection of minors on which the European Union has zero competence, 0.000 competence, it's part of the story. And even, you know, in two weeks, it should have removed, it should have been removed. I mean, basically, the seven billions, for example, a large part of the money that Hungary needs now to pay its patch, a nuclear uh, power plant, and to say goodbye to the Russians, it's part of it. And still, it's, it's not on the table. Yesterday, yesterday, there was a debate in the parliament whether they should you know, push for sanctions against Poland or not. I don't know the outcome because it was just yesterday late at night, but this debate should have been scraped from the agenda and still it was there, still it was there. So again, I mean, this, social, this software of social acceptability that now is really driving business to a larger extent than it has ever been the case before uh, is run by the very, very wrong software. Can we do something about it? As they say in Brussels, inshallah. <laughs> uh, John, your country, Britain, and my country, America, signed the Budapest Memorandum. We cannot get away from that. I don't care what Jeremy says. <laughs> and I know we have this fig leaf of, oh, it wasn't a treaty, but we guaranteed Ukraine's territorial integrity. And there is a cost to be paid for pulling out of Afghanistan and leaving you know, the stands hanging there. So now they're under the protection of Russia. We, we, there is a cost to be paid for saying Assad must go destabilizing the country. And now UN, uh, the UN vote, Israel votes uh, or abstains because Russia's protecting them flying the skies in Syria. Uh, Russia is on the march in South America China. to imagine China sends in the fentanyl and maybe 50,000 people a year die from that. And so now we're looking, we're looking at a country that suffered the holo do, do more. And now we're talking about putting them back under the kind hands of Putin. I just think it's horrific. And I think Americans would support action against Putin as long as they see their European counterparts sharing the burden and in increasing their defense forces. And I just am distraught with this whole thing. Well, I mean, I'll leave it to Jeremy to uh, uh, respond, but of course, obviously, I'm more sympathetic to your position. <laughs> it yeah. makes it possible, hard for me to yeah. respond. But, uh, but, but I would say simply, I don't blame people for doing what they can't do. But I do say that if you give someone a promise and you can't, you, you break it because you can't keep it because of practical circumstances of any kind, you may not have the money, that kind of thing, then you have an obligation then to pledge that you will meet that obligation in the long run, however long it takes. And that's the obligation we now have to Ukraine. We will make good our promise in the long run. I'm afraid it's not a very comforting uh, thing at the moment. And, by, and of course, I would support giving the planes, uh, Poland's plan of giving the planes to, uh, to the Ukrainians. And, and I don't believe it would trigger a third world war, um, or indeed, um, anything, at most, it would trigger a, a war, a, a, an intensification of the war in Ukraine for Ukraine. But I don't mind imposing higher costs on that war for the Russians, to the Russians. Yeah, and I think Melissa is sort of nicely highlighted in real time, I think, some of the divisions on the right in America on this issue. Let me, let me uh, reach out first to the point of agreement, which is, um, yes, when we throw around this rhetoric about Assad must go and then don't follow through and do all these other things and don't follow through, it has a sense of weakening us, which is, to me, the danger of this sort of moralizing about geopolitical interests and, and not being very you know, hard-headed about, okay, these are our interests, these are our actual red lines, and then if you cross them, there are going to be consequences, and then absolutely um, 
you know, following through on that, right? I think that is very dangerous. Um, I, you know, Budapest memorandum is a memorandum. I mean, that would be my, <laughs> that would be my, my kind of uh, take on it. I think also that the enthusiasm of folks uh, in America for this will go down a lot over time. Just, I mean, again, when I look at, in comparison to somebody who as a conservative in 2006, 2007, this is like several years after we got into Iraq, was suspicious, okay, and not very happy with what we were doing there and didn't want us there. Like I was in a minority of very, very, very few at that time. I mean, that's changed a lot in the, um, on the right over time, but, but that's how it was. Let me tell you, it was not a happy place to be. When I go look on Twitter, which again, I mean, bad to generalize from Twitter, but there are actually people on Twitter who are influential in real life who are saying this, who are saying like, we are not sending soldiers to Ukraine we're not getting involved militarily in Ukraine. There is a great deal more enthusiasm for that position. Um, I'd say further, and I think this is a key point, and this maybe gets a little bit to John, what you said. Um, you know, I don't think Europe is capable of sort of taking the lead and having us support that in some way. And that's the problem. And that's why I welcome Europe getting more serious about its defense, because I think this could even be a different conversation if okay, we didn't, you know, have what I would consider a treaty, but, you know, we had this sort of understanding maybe that we were going to do things for Ukraine. Europe was able to do a really meaningful conventional response to that, and they needed our nuclear backstop or whatever else you needed. They needed some logistics, they needed some planes. Um, I think that would be a much more tenable position than where we are now, which is like, well, U.S. has got to go in again, and we've just gotten spanked in two places with people herding goats, not the Russian military. Um, so I think there's just, yeah, you know, we're sort of at a high point of enthusiasm for this right now, and I think it will go lower. That's gonna be the last two questions, maybe. Um, then last three questions. <laughs> Let, let's collect them together, and then our, our panelists will have a chance to answer to all of them. Thank you. Um, I am Levan Tesekulay, and uh, first I have a remark that I am afraid uh, that uh, this, uh, we are living in a sleepover moment, as uh, Christopher Clark wrote in his book, uh, What Was uh, Just Before the First World War. So uh, I think. Uh, I think uh, politicians uh, uh, play to the, for the public, and uh, they do not uh, really know uh, the thing they play with. Uh, uh, my second question is that, uh, uh, what do you think, uh, 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 why the US uh, doesn't uh, use the most effective sanction, the price of oil? The U.S. has the capability to pour oil to the markets, start the drilling, and uh, with the low uh, price of oil, uh, the uh, financial abilities of uh, Russia are crippled. Uh, there are uh, no, no, we see painful sanctions, but uh, this uh, collapsing the economy and painful sanctions, a uh, uh, great power uh, can suffer very great griefs and sanctions if they feel that their strategic interests are in stake. And the more sanctions, uh, the more the public opinion feel they are attacked. And uh, also these sanctions destroy the middle class of the, uh, middle class of Russia, the most anti-Putin part of the Russian society. Uh, when they say that uh, uh, there are sanctions against oligarchs, Putin is glad because he is also against the oligarchs. And if the oligarchs go, go back to Russia under his umbrella, <laughs> uh, they will be uh, the puppets of uh, Putin. Not uh, he will be. Uh, he is. Uh, I don't think that uh, Putin is a, a puppet of the oligarchs, as uh, uh, you, we can find in the Western media. And uh, well, I would have some more questions, but I think that's enough. <laughs> Okay, let's go on then with these questions because you, you ask so many questions. And then we, uh, we finish the panel with two last questions with the, with the two gentlemen. Who, who would like to start? Well, I'll just say one sentence. Uh, 
uh, on the last question. Um, the policy you suggest of um, freeing up oil in various ways, which was the policy pursued successfully by Ronald Reagan when he got into office first, would have the twin effects of strengthening Western economies and weakening the Soviet economy, which is obviously why the Biden government will not give up its ridiculous commitment to net zero and other um, climate change policies. Um, and that's the full and only truth that matters. Well, and, 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 yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I agree with, yeah, and I agree. I mean, I, I agree with John. It's because it's, I'm actually an energy guy by trade. Like that's what I, I have done in my day job is to kind of pay attention to natural gas markets and things like that. So I'm very familiar with this stuff. It, it, this actually builds on something that uh, you, I think Rodrigo, maybe you were saying about doubling down on uh, well, you know, we renewables in Europe right now in this situation. I mean, it's just insane and so unserious, and it suggests, unfortunately that there is no commitment. And by the way, I'm not even anti-renewables. So this is not from a, a bigoted, like we must hate renewables perspective. It's just like, what's the tool for the job right now when you have Elon Musk tweeting that we need to drill for oil, right? Right. Like this should be a, a wake up to call to anybody who takes strategy at all seriously. Whereas instead, we're good trying to make deals with Venezuela and Iran. And, and like, it's a, we, let, we released the 20th hijacker to Saudi Arabia. And nobody even cared. It was like a page 17 story. I mean, obviously, we're doing some deal with the Saudis that's going to let, you know, I used to think September 11th was kind of important. I don't know, right? But now we're just letting this guy go back to Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's, it's just, it's nuts. I mean, certainly, I can tell you a Republican administration would not have reacted this way. But if you want, um, if you want a very negative assessment, what the kids would call a black pill on uh, where we sit, uh, geostrategically, the fact that Biden is still sticking to this absolutely, these absolutely ridiculous positions on energy in the face of where we are right now, even if he just said, okay, well, we're going to do a short-term tactical shift. I mean, it's very disturbing. Yeah. So. Maybe one thing about uh, the oil, I think maybe in the next year, in the next two years, we're going to see the return of grace, of course, of nuclear energy, and thank God, but also fracking. I think fracking, fracking will become trendy again because I'm personally not very much in favor of it. I mean, I still have a little bit, 2% of my DNA is a bit Greta Thunberg, only 2%. So <laughs> fracking as such doesn't convince me, but in times of war, you bloody do it. And if it's going to help indeed, like uh, cutting off like the dependence on Russian fossil, uh, fossil energies, I think that's part of the, of, the, of the response. And we might even see, I don't know, the, 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 let's be alert and uh, let's, let's watch also the reaction of Mr. Walk, Mr. Number One Walk in the world, Justin Trudeau. <laughs> maybe Justin Trudeau will become also a bit more pragmatic on those things. And maybe we will even forget that he was basically using totalitarian tax, tactics against truck drivers. Uh, you know, when, I, when the US goes to Maduro for a uh, I, I asked the question, was Satan too busy? Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, you know, Venezuela is okay. I mean, what, what kind of moral high ground we have yes. there? It, it was so, they had to actually do it for me to conceive of it. Like, I never could have conceived of it. Like, they actually, oh, you know, like you could do that as a, as a possibility. I mean, uh, the second point is uh, reflecting on what John said with, with Ronald Reagan. I very much like, you know, Europe trying to cut off itself from, from uh, Russian energy supplies. Two impacts it had, actually three. The first one is obviously the price of oil and gas skyrocketed. So the Russians are gonna make more money by selling less and we're gonna freeze. I mean, nicely played. Yeah. 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 So let's collect the last I, two I, questions. I think this chat has been waiting a long time. <laughs> Hello, I'm Alex Stern from Budapest Times. Uh, thank you very much for this illuminating debate. I'm just putting all these geopolitical things just aside just for a moment. I'm sort of thinking more about a sort of a, a home invasion, like a Russian revolution in a kind of Ceausescu-esque style. But that would only be achievable if the military also went on side with the people. And even further to that, sort of the breakup of Russia, perhaps, 
because then um, the, there must be a, the, there will become a certain fatigue with the people, and indeed a fatigue with the military. You can only push people around for so long and convince them with propaganda issues also for so long. And already there's reports of people, you know, and the military, the Russians in Ukraine, and uh, there's sort of that the morale is really low. But whilst the, the Ukrainians, the morale is very high, and they're very determined. And the Russians are just there thinking, I've been tricked, I've been brought. So what are the chances of putting all the issues outside, issues like oil or whatever it is, completely aside and just on the ground with the average person on the streets in the Russian cities and with the help of the minister saying, enough is enough, let's, you know, um, revolution time. So what was the chance that's at any time soon? It might be a bit of a naive question, but it's just a, a thought um, too. Thank you. Let's, let's collect the last questions together and then... Yeah. Okay, I, uh, my name's Paul Rasmussen. I'm a, I'm a tourist, but I previously worked at uh, BBC World Service. And I just uh, returning to Andrew's um, uh, uh, t talking about uh, we didn't start the fire, uh, the song, and um, you know some of the some of the comments today, which have been very interesting, um, uh, make me feel as if we've sort of come to the end of John Lennon's Imagine, and uh, you know some of these uh, very utopian ideas are. Um, uh, coming to a halt, um, and I, particularly, I, I think it's Martin was talking about the dangers of wokery. I mean, as well as the absurdities. And what I wanted to ask is, you know, and this is something that you know you might say I'm a dreamer uh, for thinking this, but, um, but the, the absurdities one. and the contradictions of woke um, could it just all collapse? in the way COVID has recently collapsed. I mean, you know, in, in, in England, it's like COVID never happened now. It's just gone, you know? The, way, the suddenness of um, Germany's rearmament, the fall of the wall, could, could woke all of a sudden become, oh, I, I was never into woke, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, it was strange, but you know, could, could, it, could it happen like that? That's my question. Yes, uh, I'm Giulio Codolani, <clears throat> um, and I am uh, editor at large of Hungarian Review. <clears throat> but I used to be the foreign policy advisor of Prime Minister Antal at, time, at a time which um, has been overlooked, and I'm very sorry to introduce a new theme here at this late time. But uh, the moderator said that uh, there is a war here for the first time in 70 years in Europe. But it's not, it's not like that. We had an eight year long war in the former Yugoslavia between 91 and 99. And I think we don't have enough time to go into to, to the lessons of that war. One thing I would just mention in passing that the, the help Hungary is giving to the uh, refugees from the Ukraine is not a new thing because in a less spectacular way, Hungarians, Croatians, Serbians, Bosnians all fled to Hungary during the time. Uh, during the time when we, had, we were absolutely, uh, ab absolutely we, we had an absolute failure in trying to alert the European uh, uh, countries to the, the approaching, to the problem of the approaching war. Um, and the war was only stopped, I think, when, uh, I, I may say, uh, with a lot of work on our side, we could persuade the Americans that this is, a, this is a terrible danger. And we could persuade also American military leaders that the, the legends about the, for, the formidable, uh, formidable force and determination of the Yugoslav army in Bosnia are just, just legends. But the war never ended until, until uh, there was one European statesman who, who said it was enough. It's not the European Union. What we, what we witnessed from the European Union was a failure, a series of failures from very important commissioners, ex-politicians going the rounds of Yugoslavia and just not, not achieving anything. Same with the UN. 
So finally, Jacques Chirac called uh, President Clinton when uh, a French soldier was changed to a, a lamppost in, uh, um, in, in Bosnia. And uh, Chirac said, that, uh, you know, Mr. President, when something like this happens to a French soldier, you know, I am as a French president, you know, I am I'm obliged to act. And I'm asking you whether you join me. We are starting, they are going ahead. Are you coming along? And, and Clinton said, yes. Now, I want to, I, I mentioned this story because I can't, you know, it's very important that Europe will once, want to develop now a stronger military capability. But I think we can't do without NATO and we can't do without the United States, you know. For, for me, it's, it's a little difficult to visualize Andrea von der Leyen, you know, uh, <clears throat> making a move in a war situation, something f f approaching to the slightest extent something that the American president or President Putin can do. I think, I think the, uh, the European Union as a decision-making entity is, is well, I, I don't want to say ridiculous, but it's, uh, we, we don't have, I think, a hope that it will be different in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have three questions here. One of the change, uh, possible change in Russia the one on the disappearance of wokeism and the parallels, and the third one is uh, regarding the parallels with Yugoslavia, uh, the war in Yugoslavia. So who would like to? Maybe to, to comment very, very briefly on, on, on the three of them, on the first one, on the possibility of a revolution. You, you said your question was naive. I think it's actually very relevant. And the moral of the troops on the one hand and the moral of the, of the public opinion on the other, uh, it's, a, it's a decisive element, especially since no one is attacking the Russians now. So they also have those questions of, first, I'm going to lose my prosperity that I gained in the last 30 years. I mean, I think this phobia of coming back to the 90s, coming back to the 90s, something that is de definitely a social force that's, uh, uh, that, that, that must be taken into account. And I would also add the fact that, you know, in the psyche of Russians, Ukrainians are brothers or cousins. One thing is to attack Afghanistan, another one is to attack your brothers or your cousins, your relatives at least. And so, especially since, you know, they are so far and I don't think they will attack you any uh, uh, at all. So I think uh, this might at least undermine the Russian public opinion to the point of having a revolution. God knows, no one knows, but I think it's a, it's a relevant point. On the collapse of wokeism, I'm very happy to get this question from a former BBC journalist. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, collapse or, 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 the, or the, to the absolute contrary there. I mean, we all read those days stupid articles on, you know, that this is a, a, a patriarchal war of white people, <laughs> things like that. I mean, they're still going on everywhere, you know, like this level of dementia. You can find it, you can find it. I think we should put some benchmarks, some test cases. Test cases, I mean, to, for example, to see whether the EU Green Deal, the EU 55 uh, deal is going to survive or not. I think that's a, good, that's, that's, a, that's a good benchmark. If it survives, then it will confirm the, uh, the opinion that this war is going to fuel wokeism instead of neutralizing it. Uh, I think this is probably the best one because the others, you know, whether we will keep, keep having, you know, like uh, other, other policies, it's less of a test. But for example, coming back to my Spanish example, if in two years instead, Spain is not reaching this 2%, of military expenses, but is still spending 4% of this GDP on turning castrated Spanish men into fully castrated Spanish men, you know? I think that will be, that will be definitely a test as well. So let's test it like that, because what I see now is that we're in a crossroad where it could either be fueled, wokeism could be basically be like the, 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 the new moral standard for the whole Western world, or indeed pragmatism and the, the the tragic, uh, real history could actually kill it. Let's put some benchmark like those ones and uh, let's wait maybe two, three years to see. <laughs> and fingers crossed. Uh, fortunately, Rodrigo helped me up in this. <laughs> I, I do agree that we are, uh, I know it sounds grandiose, but we might be at a crossroads where either this kind of logic gets reinforced and gets completely detached from reality or whether we will see a reality check, whether you know, what you see out there is real or you know, what you see inside your head is real. And um, I do hope, and 
maybe the German example is encouraging to some extent that they tend to understand that the forces of, of geopolitical gravity once again. That's, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, but you're not seeing it on <laughs> that. You're not seeing it on Deutsche Welle yet. Maybe you know a few weeks will pass and uh, and we'll see. So fingers crossed, but it's it's still uncertain. I cannot comment on Russia. I don't know Russia enough for that. And I fully support the points that Mr. Kodolanyi was making that, you know, this is not the first war in Europe since the end of the Cold War. This is the fourth or the fifth, uh, depending on whether you count Crimea as a war or not. And, uh, and I think I, I started out with saying this, that the last time Europe was tasked by securing its own perimeter, we failed miserably. And Srebrenica happened and Kosovo happened. And, you know, all those ethnic cleansings happened. And, uh, I'm, I'm a bit afraid that 30 years later, we're still not up to the challenge. Okay, can I just add something, another benchmark that's, that I think is important, another benchmark. It's precisely what is going to happen with the whole EU rule of law debate and with the conditionality debate mm -hmm. and very concretely with the release of the uh, recovery fund plans and money to Poland and Hungary. Let's put it very bluntly. If Orban wins the elections in one month here, and by the summer, this problem is not solved, then we will have also a very, very clear indication of where the wokeism in the EU is going. Yes. Um, okay. just, just very quickly, because we're, this is a debate we're having with our institute. Yeah. Uh, I think I might be wrong that, you know, the geopolitical interest might be more important than this culture bullshit, yeah. allow me to yeah. say that. So Poland and Hungary will get away with a different legal system, with a different concept of family and so on and so forth, because it won't be important. If you have people dying on your borders, that's not important. But some other, my other colleagues, a few of them think, and they're true conservative people, so I, I don't have any doubt that they think they're right, that this will only reinforce this kind of, you know, perceived moral superiority of the, of the European center and everybody who deviates from this, you know, utopia, false utopia of, you know, everybody being equal and, you know, 150 genders and stuff. So they should be brought on the line because this is the first step towards the authoritarianism we're, we're fighting on Europe's right. borders. Mm -hmm. So either way we go, I think it will be very telling. And Rodrigo's right that the, the, the indicator of that will be the release of the RFF in the case of Poland and Hungary after the election. Soon. Yeah. We don't have to wait long, at least. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, on uh, uh, Russia, it would, might be the best. Uh, it's, there's some uncertainty, but I think it would probably be best if uh, we did have something that removed Putin. However, uh, we should not have U.S. senators suggesting it on Twitter, as we actually had. So, you know, speaking of seriousness, um, uh, still getting over that one. Uh, thank you, Lindsey Graham. Uh, second uh, second uh, point on wokeism. I think with racial wokeism, there are some dynamics um, that are fundamental demographic dynamics that will make it more resistant to going away. I think for some of the rest of this, uh, Timur Koran, who's an American political scientist at Duke University, has coined a concept called preference cascade, where basically it's a little bit like the emperor's new clothes, right? Like when somebody stands up and says, this is crazy, and oh, by the way, it turns out that it was crazy, then all of a sudden you can get a very big shift. I think you may get that for some of these things. And then the final point to address uh, your comments, I opened by saying when, when we were asked what's the most important thing that I thought Europe rearming was the most significant thing and I will, will stand by that. And I also stand by it being overall a good thing that is going to make Europe behave in a more, uh, speaking as a parent of five, you know, when you give a, a kid like it say, hey, time to grow up now. Um, you know, dad's not protecting you anymore in the same way at least. Dad's still gonna be here for you, but you're on your, your own to like make your own way in the world. I think this will be a good thing. I think it will have um, positive ramifications throughout European society as a whole. And where it will happen overall, where I, I see it is, is that it won't be so ridiculous to you uh, in the future, I hope, that Europe could do a sustained and serious military response to things, whether through the EU or through national armies, I'll let people more expert uh, than me take that on. Uh, that will be taken seriously and that the U.S. will still be there and still playing a role, but will not be at the front of adjudicating these issues in Europe at the end of the day. That really has to be Europe taking the lead. Well, just very quickly, um, I would say, first of all, I, I, the idea of an event in uh, the Russian people in some form or other throwing out 
um, the, the present government? Well, I think that would be a marvellous thing, but it's obviously not something we can count on. Um, secondly, I, um, I completely agree with Dura, of course, that the, the, it, it's absolutely essential in the changed circumstances of today's world that the European-American alliance remains very strong, even though the terms on which uh, cooperation will be um, actually delivered will will obviously unrightly change because they've been very uh, it's been a false paradise for the Europeans uh, so far. Um, on, on the third question about woke, well, I think take this question very seriously, and I think that the, there are two wokes. There's the woke of the people in the streets, and there's the wokeism of the people in the suites in, and in the um, and particularly the corridors of power in Brussels. Um, you know, NATO has always presented itself as an alliance of democracies. And in the period of um, the Cold War, uh, early period, it wasn't always true, but the governments which were members of NATO, Portugal obviously was one, which were authoritarian, were responsible governments delivered on what they promised and by and large provided reasonably good government. What it seems to me worrying now is the definition which the EU certainly promotes and which is getting, I think, into the MOD and the, all of the defense departments of democracy is a, sy a system of government in which governments are subject to rule by judges and rule by bureaucratic agencies and, uh, and rule by independent central banks. I don't think that's democracy myself. And if, it's go if we're going to have that kind of government, then essentially we can't, we can't claim that NATO uh, I mean, this is what the EU is trying to impose on us in all kinds of different ways. We can't accept that as the definition of democracy we, we can believe in. So it seems to me we have to um, narrow the question of democracy back to what it is, which is a government in which the people rule and in which most of them, in which although there are some corrective agencies, nonetheless, governments selected by the people manage to get their policies by and large through. And, and, um, and that means, therefore, that the EU is not only uh, not on the side of the angels, it's actually on the side of the devils in this one. And certainly, I don't believe an alliance can be kept together on that basis. Uh, I would like to thank all, all, all of our speakers here. Please give them a loud applause. <laughs>